This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to the Sunset Safari, but of course, as you know, we have got a school drive for the first 45 minutes, and I'd like to welcome some Eldon's RC uh, Primary. It's great to have you on board with us. My name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is Fergus, and uh, we're hoping to show you all sorts of wonderful animals, so remember to ask us lots and lots of questions. But like what we saw up in front is we have some beautiful lions. For the other viewers that will be joining us a little bit later, please keep sending your questions through. You can hashtag safari live or also on the youtube chat and we will get back to them at uh, at a later stage but i look forward to having questions from all of the children today i'm sure for some of them it must be the first time that they're looking at big male lions now i don't know when i last saw big male lions so you're all very 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 lucky to see them on the safari and i'm confused because i don't know why they are laying out in the sun Normally on a day like today, and it hasn't been very cold, well, not this afternoon it hasn't, they would lay in the shade to keep nice and cool. So it's interesting to see that they're laying out in the sun. But we are coming to winter now, so it's not too hot. Now, Archie, not all lions have manes. It's just the boys, it's just the males that have the manes. And it's very important that they have big manes. Now, the main reason for it is that it helps protect them from when they're fighting, because male lions do do a lot of fighting. So it protects their shoulder, or well, around their necks, on their shoulders, and, and then also their chest, where those vital organs are. So it's very, very important that they do have a big mane like that. And then there's rumors that say that the female lions really like male lions with the darkest of dark manes. And, and that's because they say that it shows that you are really big and strong. You've got good genetics the darker your mane but not all lions manes will go dark it's sort of it's genetic so it depends what is passed on from their parents that will decide what color their mane is but these are young boys still they're only just just at the point where they can start challenging other big males now matthew the way that lions sort of cool down is that you often see them panting you know how your dog breathes very deeply they'll they'll do that and then also laying in the shade sometimes if it's really really hot you'll even see them laying in the water but uh, that is a very special sight to see sometimes in a bit of mud um but otherwise they'll just keep nice and nice and cool by keeping in the shade so i think it's warm today i, I don't know what the temperature is i've completely forgotten but i'm going to guess I think it feels about 26 degrees Celsius. So what's that, about 70, is that about 78 degree Fahrenheit? I think it's somewhere around there. Uh, maybe it's a, a little bit warmer or even a little bit cooler. But they are just fast asleep at the moment. And it's very, very, very important that these lions, of course, do sleep so that they can conserve energy now it isn't just me out on the safari with you today it seems as though Steve has found something he you'd want to eat in the bush good afternoon boys and girls I hope you're having a wonderful afternoon and I can say that because I know you're in the UK and you are in a very similar time zone to us and fantastic to have you aboard here we have got a beautiful water buck and behind in the shade is a small family of water buck and uh, they are very close to a very good watering hole where we're hoping to find all sorts of other animals as we go down and enjoy the afternoon. My name is Steve Falconbridge and I'm joined on camera by Senzo Mkise and we are down here at Chito Watching Hall and I'm sure Taylor has mentioned to, to send through your questions with your teacher. We'd love to answer them. Let us know what you'd like to talk about. But we are going to go down to the dam, to the watering hole and see if we can find ourselves some hippos. I think we might be lucky because that is their favorite habitat. I believe you are into habitats. Hmm, hello Kyron. What a beautiful question. You want to know why water bucks like water? Well, first of all, the water buck. Let's look at him, Sens. He's a lot she's a lot more pretty than I am. Um, you want to know why they like water? Well, it's all got to do with the food that they eat. Water buck, you'll never find them more than about 1.52 kilometers from water. 
so never more than a mile away from the water um, they need a lot and lot of water to drink because you see what they're wearing there they're wearing something that all of you in the winter wear is a big shaggy jacket coat and that keeps them very hot and so they need to drink a lot of water to cool themselves down more water in fact than a buffalo which is probably four times bigger than they are so they have basically come from a habitat their habitat is water and sort of long sedge like reeds and flood plains so they like getting wet and their fur actually even though it looks very shaggy and and long they've got chemicals on the fur that help to keep it dry just like a duck's back have you ever seen a duck in the water when water goes on the back it just drips off the other side and that is one of the reasons the water buck likes the water they will run into the water protect themselves against those big scraggly lions that you just saw and we have a very special treat this afternoon because james henry is back on leave and he'd like to welcome you on foot good afternoon everybody especially the youngsters there in uh, England where you are having summer and I bet it's even colder than it is here in South Africa in the middle of winter. 26 degrees Celsius it is out here. Very pleasant. That's about 89 degrees Fahrenheit, which is marvellous. My name is James Henry. On camera today we have got Sebastian Rombi. There he is. He would show you his thumb, but he's holding. Oh, there is his thumb. Wonderful. And, uh, well, as you've been asking Taylor and Steve questions, please continue to ask me any questions you'd like to. Just tell your teacher, and she'll send them through. Or he will send them through. I don't know if you've got a male or female teacher. Now, what we have here on this wall is a bit of a drag mark. Now, this is quite interesting. Can you see here? It looks like something has been dragged across the road, and that, of course, is because something has been dragged across the road. Now, normally when you see something like this, you get very excited. You think, oh, maybe a leopard has come along and killed something and dragged it across the road. But the closer we look here, the closer we can see that that's not what's happened. If you look either side of this drag mark, you can see footprints. See that? So what this means is that this is a very large lizard. Now, there are two very large lizards that live in this place. One is the water monitor lizard, and I can tell you that we're not very close to any water. The other is the tree or rock monitor lizard, and I suspect that this is the track of a tree or rock monitor lizard that has climbed one of these trees and is probably watching us. Now, this thing is probably about, ooh, I mean, they can get up to, can get up to about that big just over three feet, almost four feet, the really big ones, uh, which is obviously fairly enormous. They're just over a metre long for the really big ones. And they've got a vicious tail that they use to defend themselves from their major predators, which are largely birds of prey and leopards. Um, blooper, lizards and scales, it's an interesting one. Scales are like lizard's skin, and if they are hard, which provides them with a kind of armor that protects them from things that might uh, get at them. Uh, I'm not talking about things like monitor lizards and leopards, which will have no problem getting through the scales, but things like parasites, uh, ticks, uh, flies, insects, or arachnids that might try to suck their blood or take their nutrients, well, then scales are very important for lizards. Uh, and they're, of course, very different from the scales that you'd find on fish, uh, which allow them to be very streamlined in the water. But that's a really good question. We also had a question from Jake, uh, and I think, Jake, you said, what is my favorite part of being out here? Well, Jake, my favorite part of being out here is just being out here, because it's quiet. It smells nice, unlike the city. And it's full of life. Well, yes, our animals are not full of life. They're still fast asleep, not doing very much at all this afternoon. But like I said earlier, that's normal. That's what these cats will do on the very, very hot days. And later when it cools down a little bit, they will go walking around looking for something to eat or who knows what they will get up to. They were making lots of noise this morning. They were roaring, obviously telling all the other lions that they are here. 
and uh, hopefully they do stay around because the the male lions that used to live here they've left us they've bought some new houses a little bit away from here where there is a neighborhood that's filled with lots and lots and lots of lady lions and they like it down there so now it's opened up this spot over here for these three young boys and they've never um sort of been in charge of a pride before because like i said they're still very young but now is the time that they that they can and then hopefully hopefully in a couple of months time we'll have some more little lions running around in this area but it, i think it'll be a, a little while until they decide to wake up Mrs. Farrow, I've never really noticed to see if, if any of the African mammals sleep with one eye open. I don't think the lions do, but even though they are fast asleep, they're still listening to my every word and they're listening to all the different sounds that are out in the bush. So if I were to, or if an impala or some other animal were to try and creep up to, towards them they probably hear them moving through the grass and then react to you know how they always talk about a catnap and um and um well that's exactly what they're doing and they will react to all sorts of things so even though they're just sitting here and, and fast asleep if something comes around that they can eat they might try and catch it i mean they're very camouflaged in the grass there could be lots of impala or kudu or wildebeest or any of these animals that could come and graze into this area so come and look for food come and eat grass or even eat the leaves and they might not even know that these lions are here and uh, and then well then they can try and catch them they're not very good hunters though it does take them a, f a few goes before they're able to catch something and and these boys are fairly inexperienced still but they're also very very powerful and as they get older they'll get better and better at hunting and also the longer the three of them stay together the better they'll get to know one another so it's like when you play sports in a team it's always good to know your teammates. You need to know everything about them. You need to know their, their sort of favorite moves. And, and that's why you practice together. So when these lions go out, they are working as a team to bring down their food. So it's important that they have a good relationship with one another because a happy relationship means more successful hunts. Wow. Now I'm a little bit jealous of Steve this afternoon because it seems as though he's found my favorite animal. Yes, we have. Well, when you want to find the big animals, the best place to come and have a look is at the watering hole. And I was really hoping to find some elephant. I didn't want to say it to you before, because last time I said something like that, we didn't find them. And as soon as you went away, we found them. Look, Sens, there's a little one on the floor there. There's a little baby on the floor underneath mum. <laughs> yes, boys and girls, this is indeed the African elephant. And they drink a lot more water than a water buck does. They need to drink at least once a day. If they can, they can go for a couple of days without drinking, but they will choose not to. A very social gathering for them. There's more than one family here. Dylan, the, you want to know why elephants' ears are so big? And the purpose really is to cool them down. Their ears are used as a big uh, sort of air conditioning system and um, they are very big and there's very thin skin on the back of the ear and so lots of blood is able to move through that ear and when they flap the ear it helps to cool down the blood that is moving through the body you can see that there you can see the little veins on the back of the ear as it was moving and that is what the elephant's ears are there for that allows these huge animals in these very dry areas, very dry habitats, to keep themselves nice and cool. Corey, you want to know why they have tusks? Now, the elephant, African elephant, lives in the savanna, which is made up of trees and grasses. And what the African elephant has evolved to do is that they're able to not only feed on the grasses, they're not, able to, not only able to take their trunk and wrap the branches and feed on the leaves, they're also able to take their tusk like a, like a sharp blade, if you will, and stick it into the tree and rip off the bark, which they then eat. 
So that is one of the, the primary reason why most elephants have tusks. And then if they're a big bull, of course, a big male, then they use their tusks for fighting other males. And the bulls are generally a lot bigger than the females with a lot bigger tusks. Okay, well, from the biggest animal in the African wilderness, James has got something very small. Well, it's very small, but it's very beautiful, and it's one of the butterfly species that we get here. Now, we get lots and lots of different kinds of butterfly, apparently around about 280 species uh, in this particular area, which is enormous. We don't have quite that many at Juma, which is where we're sitting now. And I think this is one of the whites, as they call them, which is quite convenient. They're quite easy to identify because they're mostly white, of course. This one, either a common African white or a brown veined white. Now, I mean, that doesn't make a huge difference to your life, whether it's one or the other. It's just quite fun to uh, figure them out. So African common white or a brown veined white, I think, some of our regular viewers who watch these safaris every day, of course, are very good at identifying butterflies, and so if they would like to send through uh, a comment on what they think this butterfly is, well, that's fine. I'm happy to be proven wrong, because that's how we all learn. Now, he's sitting on a flower that is one of the very last flowers of the season. Now, you can see all around us and all around Steve and all around Taylor, of course, the ground is bare, and the grass is brown and goldy, and these flowers are some of the very last to provide nectar, because that's what moths and butterflies eat largely. They eat nectar. Some of them eat dung, and some of them will even eat carrion from time to time. Uh, that means rotting flesh. But these chaps largely eat nectar, and of course all flowers have got little bits of nectar on them. There he is. He's back again. And so this plant is one of the last that will provide any nectar. Isn't that pretty? Well, Nicola, the thing is, it does, it doesn't ever get really cold here, but anywhere where it's cold, especially where you live, of course, in Britain it gets much colder than it ever gets here. And in some parts of South Africa it can get pretty cold. And the reason butterflies and most insects don't like that, of course, is because they can't generate their heat internally like us. So you are able to live in very cold climates, A, because you can put clothes on, and B, because you're a mammal, which means that you can produce your own body heat. Animals that cannot produce their own body heat, like uh, reptiles, for example, uh, amphibians, and, of course, insects, they can't live in very cold environments, and if they are in very cold environments, they must either hibernate or they must migrate. They must move out of those areas during the winter time. That's why a lot of birds, birds are, can produce their own heat, but it is why a lot of birds leave a place like Britain for the winter, because there are no insects around. And so these insects can't move around uh, when it's cold, and that's why you just don't see them very much in winter. All righty, one of the things I like to do in the summer is something that these elephants are enjoying in the winter. Yes, well, another family. Did you hear that African fish eagle? That is the sound of the African bush. And we have another family of elephants coming to, to the watering hole. It's a very social affair coming down here. And lots of families come and meet each other and join. This is probably four or five families that are here. And they still keep coming over the wall there with their babies and the big mothers and lots of youngsters and sub-adults and kids, teenagers, they, they come to see what's happening. They come to see who's here and uh, they might even come and say hello to us. Wow. Here's a nice big grandmother, I would say. She's walking straight towards us now. This is 100% live, and these are 100% wild elephants. But her eye is very soft. She's going to walk as close to us as she wants to. And then she's going to stand there, and her family is going to walk behind her. And they're going to walk 
you know, she's quite happy with us. Yeah, they all come. Yeah, they all come. The whole herd of them. This is so special. Some of them are covered in mud. They like to cool down that way. See the little youngster in the left of the screen? I was talking about the ears. When they get cold, they pace their ears to the side of their head so that they don't lose too much heat. Easy and Natalie, you want to know if elephants have bones in their trunk? No, they don't have bones. It's all muscle. They reckon there's about a hundred thousand muscles in the trunk of an elephant and it takes them some time to use it. That individual there is very well with his trunk. Now the one that's coming up just behind sends that one has no idea what it's doing. The little youngster, sorry, the little youngster to the left. That little youngster has no idea what to do with the trunk. It can't pick anything up. It basically, when it drinks, it uses its mouth, but it is learning. It's learning from mum and from its family and from its sisters, but it takes a good year or two until it's very, very efficient at using that trunk. But it's very funny when you see youngsters come down to drink. I think there might be one over there because they stick their whole face into the water. I don't know if you can see one at the back there, Sense, but it looks like it might have its head in the water. That one there, yeah, that's what elephant youngsters do. They just stick their mouth in the water because they can't pick up the water with their trunk. The other elephants, they pick it up, they suck it up into their nose because the trunk is actually a nose. Do you know that? Imagine sucking up about 10 liters or so of water into your nose and then squirting it into your mouth. Ooh, <laughs> he's, he's swimming. Look at that little guy. Mrs. Sambe, you want to know how much an elephant... Sorry about the noise here. There's, a, there's an elephant cow having a, a toilet break right here. And it was very loud. How much does an elephant weigh when it's born? Well, it's about just over 100 kilograms. Just over 100 kgs. So, enormous. But talking about um, James's butterfly, butterflies will come to that dung, that elephant dung there. And obviously we're close to the water, so they can get water from the watering hole. But elephants, when they, when they drop their dung far away from water, butterflies will actually rely heavily on the moisture coming off the elephant dung to sustain themselves. Well, we are completely surrounded by elephants right now. This is one of my favorite things in the entire world. There's a little baby. There's a little youngster here. Hello. Yes, we are surrounded. Look at this. Hello. They're everywhere. And they are wild. They are quite relaxed to seeing us on the vehicle. Nicola, why do they make a noise with their trunks? Well, they make lots of noises, not just with their trunks, but also with their belly. But when they're excited, or when they're upset, when they're communicating, when they're trying to chase someone away, they'll quite often make a big trumpety sound. So lots and lots of communication. Look at all of them. It's a wall of elephants here. This is fantastic. I haven't seen this many elephants in so long. So the trunk is for all sorts of communication. The elephants can communicate with each other. Here's a little baby rolling in the dirt. Oh, hello. <laughs> That's the same one that got wet. See, so also when they get too hot, they'll cover themselves in water and even cover themselves in mud if they can but it's very interesting what's going on here I don't know why they all gathered together they all seem to know that something's going on sometimes when you see elephants hanging around like this all together in a group yes some of them are drinking but every now and again what can happen is one of them can be giving birth and they've all come together for that sort of spectacle I've only ever seen it once before in my life but there, if we're going to talk about families, there you can see two families, one on the left and one on the right. You can see how they're kind of separated. It's like when you go to the shopping center or to the restaurant, you see the family sitting at the different tables. That's the same here, but they will still come together because sometimes they have a big family dinner and all the cousins and nephews and everybody comes and then you just push the table together. That's what's happening here. Lots and lots of families of elephants that are coming together and they are enjoying themselves thoroughly at Chitwa Chitwa Watering Hole. Very 
very, very nice that you're getting to see some elephants down at the dam. That's my favorite animal in the whole wide world. And honestly, there's nothing better than watching uh, elephants play around in the water, especially the little ones. Now, we left our lions because they were fast asleep and not doing very much at all. Hoping to try and find some other animals. So, we'll be looking for things like zebra and wildebeest and inyala and warthogs and maybe some elephants, who knows, a giraffe. But we have to do a little bit of driving to try and find some of those creatures. And I'm sure I'll show you some of the prettiest birds in South Africa if they decide to stay and not fly away. Sometimes they feel like they're camera shy and every time you try and put them on, on camera to show everybody they all like to fly away. So this is a very nice area to find any of those animals that I said. Samuel, it's, I suppose it depends at what time of the year it is that would, I'd be able to sort of tell you how many birds there are. So I would say there's roughly just over 250 or so birds that we see all year round. And then in summer, we get the migrants that come from all over the world. Some come from further north in Africa, others come from Europe, and they all come to visit South Africa. And uh, then you maybe can have just over 300, just under 300 or so, but there's lots of birds. There's over 850 birds in, in Southern Africa alone. How cool is that? That's a lot, hey? I think that's a lot of birds, and there's some really, really beautiful ones. I can't believe we haven't seen any African green pigeons. They're one of my favorite. They're like bright green in color. And I just sit up in, in some of these big trees that get lots of fruit. There's one, but that's not. I'm gonna show you a very pretty bird. It's called a black-headed oriole. This is not the one that I wanted to tell you about. There we go, just drop a bit. There we go. There it is, just hiding behind the, uh, the branches of the marula tree. It's got a very pretty call as well. It's a very, very bubbly sort of sound. But it's yellow, black with a bright orange beak. But it's not singing a beautiful tune today. It's just resting up and hiding away from the sun. You can see it's sitting in the shade. Probably been out trying to look for food. Very nice. Right, well, we'll move on from this bird. It seems as though James has got one of the antelope I was telling you about. This is the most common antelope that we find here, and it is called the impala. For those of you who have, don't know, perhaps some of you have been out to Africa and you know that. And they are, I suppose, the equivalent of what you'd find in some deer species you might find in the UK. But they live in much hotter environments and they don't ever lose their horns. Of course, those horns stay with them always. Now, this is a bachelor group of male impala. And you can see they're male by their horns. And it's a very interesting time of year for them because they've just come through a period known as the rut. And they really don't like each other at all. They're fighting with each other over females. You don't find them in groups of males like this. And now, as the days have become progressively shorter, so the impala have become with each other. And you can see there's no animosity between them at all. They're not angry with each other. They're a little bit of play fighting. But otherwise, they're sticking together in order to try and avoid predators. So they'll be looking out for predators together to see if they can spot any spots of a leopard or a tawny shadow of a lion floating through the grass, or maybe even a cheetah or some wild dogs. Those would be the animals that like to eat them. Alrighty, we're going to continue along here. The elephants are still at their games. Yes, they are. They're all here. And they're all having so much fun. They're very, being very slow today. And that little youngster is being very inquisitive. You see how his ears are plastered against his head? I think a lot of these elephants are actually just coming here to have a little bit of a snooze. Come down to the water, they've had a drink. They're all behaving very, very casually. Just going to have a little bit of a an afternoon siesta. Standing up, of course. 
when you're a very big elephant like this, it's very hard to stand up after you've laid down. So quite often you will find them in, in bits like this, having a bit of a sleep. Megan, it takes some time, you know, for them to really properly feed. Um, they're drinking milk from mum for a good year and a half to two years of their life, so they don't really need... <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> now mum's going to step in and sort it out. Watch here. What are you doing? Just like children, parents around. There's some really interesting behavior going on. Let's just listen to it. This is so special. Okay, they're not making any more noise. But they're constantly practicing and learning to use that trunk. You'll see this little one over here is copying its sister or older brother with the foot. You see the foot? And then it's trying to use the trunk as well. And they'll always walk up to something that mum has fed on and dropped on the floor. And they'll try and copy what she's doing. And then after a period of time they can pick it up but they don't quite know what to do with it and it moves it around. And then eventually after about a year and a bit they start actively being able to put it in their mouth. But it's not important for them to be eating it yet because they're still getting most of their food from suckling mum. And then after two years then it's important for them to start feeding. But that's a very long time but two years to figure out how to use all those muscles. <laughs> it's a good amount of time constantly practicing see, see this one here oh he's going to drink this one wants to drink over here this little youngster is underneath mum he's trying to drink can't find can't find it it's in the front leg there we go she's lifting her front leg to help Honey, you want to know if different families like each other? Most certainly. Um, what happens is elephants live for a very long time, almost like humans. So when you have an old female, she's probably got sisters and cousins that have moved off and made other herds of themselves as they've had kids. So when she was a youngster, she might have had a whole lot of friends in the family hanging, hanging around. And as they grew older, they moved off and formed their own herds. And they do remember each other. That story of elephants have got a very good memory is very true and they know each other by sight and by smell and it's very common to find this sort of behavior where herds come <laughs> hello <laughs> where herds come together and they come and hang out again and they show off possibly new youngsters that haven't been seen before uh, because there's a lot of youngsters here that probably were done in the last six months or so and maybe the herd hasn't seen each other in that amount of time. So when they come back together again, they like to show off each other, show their cousins and their new nephews and their new nieces. It's a very special time really and I was, we are so privileged to be spending time with this enormous herd of elephants here down by the watering hole and they are giving us so much, so much patience. <laughs> This, there's a young bull in front of us that is having a really, really interesting time on his own. He's been chasing birds. He's now going to move a stick. He's a young boy, and he's kind of at that age where he gets pushed away from the herd. So he's not very welcome inside the herd. So you often find them on the outside sort of just playing around on their own. But we're going to stay here with these elephants. Let's go to James, who's got another animal on foot. Now these are, to my mind, the most beautiful antelope that we get here. That is a male Nyala. He's about one and a half times the size of an Impala, which we saw earlier. Probably stands about four feet at the shoulder, just over a meter. And they tend to live in much thicker bush than the Impala do. They'll just have you still got in there. I'm just having a look-see. I'm just talking to Sebastian to see if we can get a better view. There's probably a slightly better view up here, Seb. Let's have a look through here. So he weighs about 100 kilograms, that big male. And unlike the Impala, they are exclusively browsers, which means they'll be looking for green leaves to eat. There we go. 
It's watching us there. Look at that. Nicola, you <laughs> want to know if I'm scared of anything? Nicola, yes, I suppose sometimes I can get a bit scared. The trick to being out here, though, is not to be afraid. It is to understand how animals and other creatures will see us. And normally they see us as a threat, which means they are afraid of us, and they react in a manner that indicates that. So something like those lions, for example, if we saw them on foot, they would run either away from us or towards us, and if they ran towards us, they would be saying, please get out of here, you're making me afraid. So as long as you understand that, and you understand, of course, that most of the animals out here are much stronger than we are, as long as you understand that, you don't need to be scared, you just need to be respectful, uh, very respectful of everything out here, and then you can stay pretty safe. It's a scary place to come if you're not trained to live in an environment like this, it can be scary, uh, but it's not very scary after you've been out here a long time. It's very pleasant, and you've just got that little edge, uh, which is nice, and of course, it's wonderful to live in a respect with nature. Yes, well, we don't know what to look at right now, boys and girls. We are surrounded by elephants, and they are all just having so much fun. <laughs> Every time Senzo looks at one, another one does something else. It is an eye. It is, what, it, what is the word? It is an amazing amount of activity going on all around us. This very dead stick in his mouth. Just going to another herd has arrived. Let's have a listen. They don't like everybody, that's for sure. Since this one here was going to charge us here, he was making, he was, he was trying to trumpet. So sometimes they don't like each other. Sometimes there's a herd they might not be familiar with, and then the behavior starts to change. Dylan, you want to know if elephants have got a very good memory. They do. They've got an amazing memory. Uh, they remember everything, we think, anyway, from a very young age all the way up until they're very old. And um, that is how the herd works. So the females will lead the family around in search of good food and good water that she learned from her mother and from her grandmother. So it's very important and very interesting information. And it's always fun to watch a herd come back <laughs> sorry sorry this, this elephant is really playing don't throw that on us now <laughs> okay what's going on ladies it's okay it's okay we are completely surrounded now by elephants and I think everything's fine yeah, everything's fine. everything's fine. Listen to the noises. This is unbelievable. Okay, girls, it's okay. We've been here the whole time. It's okay. We've been here the whole time. I think something happened with a bull that came in from the side, and it just it just upsets them a little bit sometimes. But everything's okay. How nice is the sounds? They know that we're not here to cause any trouble. They're just looking at us. Maybe some of them didn't even know we were here. They were so fast asleep. And then suddenly they realized it. And what are you going to do now? Are you going to put your bottom on my car? <laughs> I don't know where to look, guys. <laughs> this elephant has kicked that branch against the front of the car now. It's okay, young one. And there's a really big girl off to my left. We are probably, before we have to leave the sighting, are going to have to move that branch. Because it's now underneath my front wheel. You can smell them. They've got a nice sweet sort of smell. I could touch this one if I wanted to, but I would not. You don't touch wild animals. definitely something going on with one of the females. It's possible that one of them might be near having or giving birth to a baby 
That's why the behavior is like this. They're all coming together. They're all being very protective. Um, that individual picked the stick up in front of us and dropped it, and then that caused the herd to go a little bit crazy because it was an unnatural sort of sound for them that came out of nowhere. And just like that, they slowly start to move off in the other direction. This is very special. Can never get tired of this. Can never, ever, ever get tired of this. Sorry, Lukey, I think I got your comms there. Luke is the director in FC who's making the show run cleanly, clearly. How special is this, boys and girls? Okay, well, as these uh, elephants slowly move off, let's go and see exactly whereabouts Taylor is. I am, and I've seen something that I don't know what it is. I think it's an eggshell. Looks like it. Looks like there's some bits and pieces that have broken. It could be something else, but I'm not sure what it is. Now, for eggs of those size, sure, that would have to be something like an Egyptian goose. And I wonder where they're nesting, that somebody would have got hold of an egg. There's lots and lots of different animals out here that would eat eggs. Like, there's a creature. There's the Egyptian goose, I think, who's laid that big egg somewhere. And... There's a creature called a water monitor. Some of you know what a Komodo dragon is? I bet you've heard of a Komodo dragon. It's like a miniature version of that. And they are thieves at stealing eggs. They're really good. They've got big sharp claws. They can and, and also dig them out. They like to dig up tortoise eggs too. But that Egyptian goose is all on its own, which is bizarre, because normally they're in groups. And what is our friend the hippopotamus doing? Where's he going? He's moving. There's just one hippo here, not like the other dam where Steve is, where there's lots and lots of animals. And that hippo is just walking now along the bottom of the water. He's not swimming. It just goes to show you it's very shallow there. Very, very, very shallow. And he's a, a lonely boy. He's in this dam all by himself. But he won't be in here for too much longer, maybe another hour or two, before he decides to go and look for some dinner, some grass. Oh, it gets shallow there. Look how big he is. See how he's come out of the water? Look how shallow it is. Wow. Oh, watch this. Let's see. Why are you so unhappy? Now, he made that noise because he's shouting at us saying, don't come any closer. But I can promise you, Mr. Hippo, I'm not going to come and join you in the water today. I didn't bring my bathing suit. So no swimming f for Fergus and I. They're very cool though. Now, I'm sure of the, the, it's fairly easy for these animals to live in the heat. It's actually not that hot at this time of the year. In summer, it gets very hot where it can get over 100 degree Fahrenheit very, very easily. Um, so they just they sort of just get used to it. And it's tough, especially if you're very young, because some days are really, really hot, and then they go freezing, freezing cold. And um, there's something called cold shock, which we normally see with young baby animals. They end up dying because the temperature is changing too quickly, basically. But the heat is, is not so bad. As long as you can keep yourself cool by standing under a shady tree, some animals, like you saw with the elephants, they will go in the water to keep nice and cool, or they'll cover themselves in mud. They all have different ways to try and cool themselves down. So that's quite nice. I don't even think that this water would be very cold. I think it would actually be quite warm. But it's drying out quite a bit now. And as winter progresses, more hippos will come in here. They're just walking around in there, Connor. Hippos don't swim like you and I. They can't do freestyle or breaststroke or butterfly. They actually sink to the bottom and then they'll run along the bottom of the water. Kinda, it kind of looks like when a man is walking on the moon um, with the lack of gravity and they sort of bounce up and down. So they're really good at holding their breaths like you can see now. You just see all those little bubbles and they can stay under the water for about six minutes. So that's a long, long, long time. I don't even think I could hold my breath under the water for 30 seconds. That's just because we don't do much swimming anymore. But it was great to have you all join us today. I hope that you enjoyed the safari. You got to see lots and lots of different animals, which is amazing. Um, but I hope that you all do your homework and you listen to your teachers. 
Your teacher asked me to say that. No, I'm just joking. She didn't. But um, I hope that you did enjoy the safari. And from all of us here at Wild Earth, it was great having you on board. But uh, it's time for us to say goodbye now. And I'm going to send, uh, well, everybody else back over to Steve. Good afternoon everybody and welcome back on the regular show to all your viewers. We've just had the most amazing sighting with a beautiful herd of elephant that is slowly moving off in the distance. I can't put words on how I'm feeling right now. One dumped a stick in front of the road and I, I completely forgot about it and drove into it but it didn't damage anyone. But uh, And then we had a little baby. As you, as you went across, who came and charged us. I'm going to be... <laughs> oh, I don't know what else to say. We're going to park right over here and watch that herd just sort of materialize into the distance. What an afternoon. And please feel free to send through your questions. Hashtag Safari Live or on the YouTube stream, whatever platform you prefer. What a start to the afternoon it has been. I said to Senzo on our way down, I really want to see elephants and I think I've just had the best elephant on a vehicle sighting of my life. And I've had many. That little one there charged us a moment ago. It was very cute. It was very, very cute. <laughs> I, did take a, I did take a little video on my phone. I don't know if that works. Will it work, Sens, to show that? Okay, Senzo actually wanted me to do something for um, a little elephant thing, so I took my phone out. Sens, can you see this? Ladies and gentlemen, it's on my phone. I wonder if you can see it. I'm going to position. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> That's what we experienced just before. We got to about a meter and a half away from me and then hid behind mum. I nearly fell down the bank as they ran away. <laughs> they were a little bit late behind the herd and just very excited to catch up. And they'd heard all the trumpeting and must have thought the rest of the families chased them away so surely we can do the same. Malaika, cute is another, there's, an, is, there's just more to it than cute. It's just unbel <laughs> unbelievably, adorably cute. I don't know what to do now, Sens. Um, the elephants are disappearing back off that way. They probably look like they're going to be heading into Torchwood. Uh, probably going to feed a little bit in the, in the drainage there. Maybe, maybe we go have another look. Well, we'll see if we can get another view of these elephants. And in the meantime, James Henry is still out on foot. Yes, I have not taken to my wings yet. I've decided to remain on my feet. Uh, because my wings, well, they're just a little stiff. I did some flying yesterday, and, uh, well, I can't fly at the moment. Uh, good. So uh, it's wonderful to be back in the hot seat, or hot shoes, as they say. And uh, so please do talk to us, of course, using the hashtag SafariLive. Uh, it's been a long time since I've spoken to any of you, and that's, of course, because I've been away. I was in Grand Cayman. Uh, with the Dive Live team, learning how to dive, which was very special indeed. And then I was in the United States for five nights, and now I'm back here. So it's very pleasant to be back at Juma, and I must say, in the three or four weeks that I've been gone, the landscape has changed profoundly. It was still quite green when I left. It's now completely, completely golden winter brown, and the only bit of greenery we're finding is here in the drainage systems. <coughs> Ali, no, I got my new hat, thank you for noticing, from a very kind person called Christina who managed to find me a brandless hat that fits my hair, doesn't make me look like I've got horns or a tail out the back of my head. It's the perfect hat. So thank you, Christina, for that. Uh, so that's where it comes from. Uh, hopefully it lasts. Uh, they don't last very long, of course, because they'll put through their paces out here. But uh, Christina managed to get me this marvellous hat. So we're now crossing the valley of the great Umluwamati drainage. And you can see the last little bits of colour coming off that Tamburti tree there. And I will just tell you, of course, that we have passed the winter solstice, which does give one the false hope that it's about to start getting warmer again. Well, in the case here, 
or as is the case here, it never really gets very cold. And so we don't really have to worry about that. And for most of you in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, your real summer month is August. So there we are. Thank you very much for your kind welcomes back to me. It's very nice to be back. And uh, on that note, I'm going to send you back to Miss McCurdy. It's great to have you back, James, although I've only seen you for about two seconds today. But I'm sure we will catch up a little bit later. And uh, I'm driving down Hyena Road at the moment. I don't know why, what made me come down here, but something was drawing me in this direction. So maybe we'll pick up, we'll see some tracks of a, a leopard who will not be named. Maybe we must just stop referring to that leopard that's named, spelt T-H-A-N-D-I, and um, maybe she'll arrive and just show up. So. I haven't actually seen any evidence that she's been about, which makes me think that she's probably just on a kill somewhere. I actually haven't seen any of her tracks at all, not from this morning and definitely not from this afternoon. And uh, so it's a tough one. It's, it's a tough one. I've driven some of her favorite roads now, but absolutely nothing. I think of anything, I think she's probably between Buffalo Dam, Cheetah Cutla and Quarry Pan Road. There's a, well, not quite Quarry Pan Road, but central and that big square where we lost her tracks so i think she's around and in there it's, like we've been saying it's just so difficult to try and get into that area even on bushwalk you can walk right past her and uh, not even know that she was there very exciting though it seems as though steve's gamble of going down to chitwa dam has really paid off Good afternoon dylan are there any updates on chitwa for the afternoon Copied. Sorry about that, everybody. There's a tricky gremlin spot down at uh, at Chitwa Dam where sometimes you you lose communication, and uh, yes, that happens actually often. It's the most bizarre thing how I won't have communication. I won't have comms with final control, but then the cameraman will have communication, and then it's vice versa. I'll have radio comms, and then cameraman won't have anything. So. The, I don't understand how technology works half of the time, but anyways, we're ready to, we're ready to carry on. I'm sure Steve will, will get to a spot where he'll be able to chat to you and you can go back and enjoy the elephants. Sure, Robert, you know, I didn't see, I didn't see many leopards for a long time in the Eastern Cape. We used to see them on the camera trap. Sometimes we would hear them, we'd see the, you know, we'd see active signs that they'd been around. But the sightings done in the, along the coast of South Africa, of the Cape Mountain leopard, they're few, few and far between. So probably then, but let, let's talk about now, let's talk about more recently. I definitely think if it wasn't for Tingana the other night, that probably would have been the longest I went without seeing a leopard. Was, wasn't it almost two weeks that I didn't see a leopard? I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain it was close on two weeks, but I ca cannot actually remember. I try not to remember things like that because it's a little bit depressing. <laughs> Driving around in the area where the Sabi sand is the, one of the densest populations of leopards and then I can't find any. It's, you know, can imagine uh, it make any safari guide want to pull their hair out. Oh, is that a little mongoose sitting there? Can you see it? No, no way. I'm gonna, hopefully it's not going to. So it's just a teeny tiny little mongoose, all on its own, which is bizarre. What are you doing there by yourself? It's so small. Is it in a sun coma? It looks like it. Sorry, we're just having some issues with the camera. 
Ferg will get it all sorted in a second. Thankfully, the mongoose is, for the first time ever, it's being obliging. and staring at us. Perhaps it thinks if it just sits there very quietly, um, we cannot see it. Maybe that is the case. Hello, little one. Where's your f family? Now, we know that mongoose are not, well, these mongoose are not solitary creatures. They're not like the slender mongoose, who are often seen on their own, or even the yellow mongoose. These guys live in colonies. And I don't know where the rest of the, the group is. They might just be foraging off in the distance, but very dangerous to be sitting out in the open like that. Very, very dangerous. Any bird of prey, any bird species that uh, feeds on small mammals would find that to be the perfect snack to best best it to be very careful now i didn't sorry i didn't quite hear what luke had to say but i think i might be sending you back to steve perhaps he's got communication again i do have comms i'm sorry i must have just been in a little bit of a shadow there but we are have managed to caught, catch up with the herd and they've all started feeding apart from this little one on the ground who is uh, having an absolute elephant of a time in the sand as you do and there's a little bit of a reassuring trunk from from an older one whether it's mum or not is hard to say there we go I managed to get up very good and there's definitely interesting behavior going on with this herd there's a bit of screaming and shouting going on I'm not quite sure what is happening in general but they haven't moved very far. They're all busy feeding, as I said. But that little one is going to show everyone how big he is. I'm very big. Oh, off he goes. Chasing everything. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry, little one. There's a little one right in front of us who is uh, giving me a little bit of a hard time, aren't you? That's okay. Ooh, yes, bless you, whatever that was. Yes, you are formidable and you are very big. Your, mo your mom is a bit bigger. Brian, no, they don't flap them. Ooh, here comes another one. He's charging in front of us. <laughs> you see what it does there, Brian? The elephant, when they lift their ears up. Now, there's just an aeroplane flying over. And elephants don't be don't seem to be too concerned elephants will will flap their ears because they are hot and the flapping of the ears is to cool them down in their air conditioning system um, but when they open their ears out like that one did and move towards you they're basically making themselves look a lot bigger a lot lot bigger so it's all about sort of trying to intimidate you um, but it's always funny with the youngsters but when a big adult does it it's not funny it's a lot more serious but the youngsters have to practice those techniques because it works for mum and they hope it works for them but it doesn't really work for them and we're being flown over right now it'd be interesting to see if the elephants react at all to this and yes they did that is the thing with airplanes Elephants are relaxing quite quickly because there's no negative reinforcement. It's loud. Elephants have got a very good sense of hearing. There's nothing that follows it, nothing that influences them other than that initial noise. So, yes, it's loud. That's what puts them off a little bit. But there we go, straight back to their feeding. It was actually uncomfortably loud even for me. So you can imagine what it might have been like for them. Zach, the average size of an elephant herd, well, this is not average. This is a whole lot of herds together. So right here on the left, that is the average size of an elephant herd. You call it a family. But then you see the big lady on the right. She might have a sister, and so they might accumulate. So you, could, could, you, you get families within herds, and then you get herds and herds which then form aggregations. So, for example, you could have two or three or four young elephant and after a period of time they end up becoming ooh, lots of screaming going on 
they become mature or adults and then because the herd or the feeding gets a bit limited they split off and end up with two uh, small families and then three and then four and but then eventually like now you can see them all coming back together to socialize to feed <coughs> excuse me there's a lot of dust in the air and I apologize for sneezing so really you could be anywhere from three up to 20 now, I've seen elephants up the groups up to 200 before but if you split them apart they would all move off into small little family units with uh, the matriarch being the biggest female and then s sort of smaller females below her making up the rest of the breeding females and then obviously their associated offspring and once that herd just gets a little bit too big from a food resource point of view they will move off and then eventually we'll come back together and uh, say hello it's really something special to see Ellie's coming back together and what is that one doing Sense? oh he's finished now he was busy digging his nose into the ground okay well we're gonna leave we're gonna stay with these elephants I don't think we're going anywhere but I think James is on foot still of course he is and he's looking at the ground possibly One of the things you find in cities, of course, is posturing male human beings. And the things that they like to do are not entirely dissimilar from the things that caused this tree to look like it does. This was, of course, affected by uh, an impala ram trying to show how big and strong he was in comparison with all the other impala rams. Much as is the case with uh, female human beings as well, they're normally not around during the posturing session. They normally get very bored by the posturing and they go off and do something useful while the men posture to themselves. Now this normally happens at the gymnasium uh, or the gym at about sort of six o'clock in the morning in the heavy weight section where men, instead of rubbing their heads against the wall, uh, they pick up heavy weights and then drop them on the floor and go, ah, to show how big and strong they are. Impala don't have that option uh, for two reasons. One, they don't have opposable thumbs and so therefore they can't uh, lift weights. And secondly, possibly even more importantly, they have yet to develop the technology to smelt iron ore and make iron. So, you know, the Impala must resort to rubbing their heads on bushes. So that's what went on here. This tree will now recover. Very relieved that the Impala rutting season is over. So that's good. Uh, also, of course, good is the smell around here at the moment. Uh, we've reached the time of the year when, uh, well, if one can get away from one's own smell, uh, one smells potpourri around here, this kind of subtle bush potpourri, and it's mainly caused by these, uh, oh, I nearly forgot their name, Combretum trees. Hmm, very nice. Sebastian, would you like a whiff? There you go, have a whiff of that. Isn't that nice? He's going, mmm. Yes, a bit, a bit like a sort of bay leaf. Yeah. Delicious. A bit like a bay leaf. It's quite dry, subtle, nice smells. And that is, of course, Combritum apiculatum. Steve Ovo does not appear to be going very far this afternoon. No, we are not going anywhere. We are in an elephant roadblock once again. And the beautiful thing about it is we moved into the area again like we did earlier and the elephants came to us and surrounded us. So that is how they make their space. If they're more than willing to walk towards you, we've given them lots of area to walk past, but they've all decided to come right up like this one and give us a little bit of a sniff. Yes, I did shower this afternoon, my dear, I did. I had some quite hardcore sprints on quarantine. Steph got involved this afternoon and I think I'm coughing up a lung because of it. So I did, I did shower, but I can't imagine what these elephants are able to smell from us. Zach, that's a very good question about elephants and bloodline. I mean, the Kruger Park maintained elephants at a population of about 7,000 for a long time. <clears throat> That's a lot of animals, if you think about it. So I'm sure of the Krug, of the elephants that we have in the Kruger these days, they're all related to some extent, but quite a large sort of genetic base. Uh, but it's hard to say whether they're all 
related. Uh, smaller populations, so in places where there are very, very small populations of elephants, if they then reproduce and grow, then yes, they would all be connected from a breeding standpoint. But the, the genetics of the Krug elephants are regarded very highly and very d dynamic and very diverse, albeit there might be some common sort of breeding lines from the back from many years back. But elephants used to roam most of southern Africa and then small populations were maintained in sort of the KZN KwaZulu Natal area and in southern Kruger and they all grew back to quite large numbers. Small reserves generally can have a problem with the genetic makeup. Ooh, hello mama. She is a big girl. Andrew, if a lone elephant bull came into this herd, that's what often causes all of the nonsense that you see in a herd, all of the argy-bargy and the, the shouts. I do apologize about the back of the vehicle and our shadow. I don't want to be starting, but if a male comes in, then he often causes trouble because all he's interested in is mating, all he's interested in is other things, not looking after the kids, and it often causes the females to shout at him quite a lot. So I'm just going to reverse back a couple centimeters so we can uh, get a look at these ellies without the back of our car getting in the way. But males are definitely the ones that cause all of the drama. Lanon, no, I've never heard of matriarchs getting into dominus battles. They're very sort of uh, very together ladies, you know, as in most most uh, most grannies would be. They sit down, they have a cup of tea, or in this case, a branch off of a russet bush willow, and they discuss their way forward. Um, I've never seen any dominance between matriarchs, but you quite often will find a female that might be of another herd coming in, and maybe she she nudges or she, she gets a little bit too close to a youngster that she's not supposed to, and uh, you might get a little bit of a snap or a bit of a shout, a bit of posturing, but you don't often see female elephants physically fighting. Every now and again, females will have to discipline young boys who step out of line. Uh, I think Jamie got a very nice clip of that last year, of a young elephant bull that got flattened by a female, and he hopefully learned his lesson. This is so special to be able to spend this time with these ellies. Angie, the, the age ellies get booted out, it's, it's kind of debatable, but it's by the time they start showing sexual interest. So between the ages of maybe 14 and 16, 17, somewhere around there, uh, bearing in mind females start breeding or can start breeding at about the age of nine, guys, the, the boys are a little bit later in that. But as soon as they start, I mean, some boys ripen earlier than others, so if they start showing interest in their sisters and their, their mums and their aunties, and when I say interest, they'll walk up behind and they'll put their trunk to go and smell areas they shouldn't be smelling. Um, it's just interest. It gets peaked and their brain starts operating in a different way. And very quickly, the females will chase them out and go, no, 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 young boy, you're going to have to follow the herd from now on. And then they follow for a very long time until they find friends of their own. I like the way you describe that, Steve. Very sweet. Now, Berg and I are driving far and wide. We've, we've basically started in central Juma and then we went all the way to the east and now we're going all the way to the west. I thought we might as well just quickly check in pile of planes just to make sure that those cheetah didn't cross back again. So we will head all the way down here and, and just have a quick look, a little look around to see so that'll be quite um, quite nice if they did come trotting back this side. However, I think we're being a bit optimistic. I think they, well, mom has tried to search this area and hasn't found any food for the last couple of days. So she probably feels like she's exhausted all her options here on Juma and has to go back sort of to the west. If only she knew that she needed to walk a little bit further to the north and uh, only a couple of hundred meters too. I don't think the wind was in her favor, but there were some huge hides of impala around. And uh, I think there were some kudu as well. There were wildebeest about. 
So there was an opportunity for her. She just was not looking in the right spot. Kind of like when I'm looking for animals sometimes when I don't look in the right spots and then I don't find anything. So yeah, so that's what we're doing. I'm just driving a little bit quicker because we've got the Juma car behind us taking stuff to the gate. Tiamath, us, yes, yeah, the animals do have to survive on dry grass. They don't really have a choice. They can't just go to the restaurant, you know, and they can't come to Voyatella Lodge and stand there with their plates and ask for the micro herbs that have been brought in from the, you know, from Hootsprate or from um, where they grow them just outside the reserve. So they unfortunately can't do that. So, and that's why winter is tough for these animals here, is because for three months of the year, the vegetation is really unfavorable and lacks serious nutrition that's because there's no rain around and and that does take an effect on the animals but they don't have a choice so they lose condition they definitely do lose condition but then they put it back on very quickly too so it's, it's exciting in the Mara in Kenya it's, uh, we we're talking about other it's the reason why the animals get so big is because they don't uh, well they don't go through that period where it's absolutely dire like it is here in the Sabi sand I mean by the end of July there won't be much grass left there still be some of it but it there will be sort of more open patches and very sandy kind of like what the road looks like um, and then the only green trees we'll really be seeing will probably be the guari trees will be the most well this area will stay fairly green to the tops of the trees the grass will disappear so yeah so they can it's just not great however so you start monitoring start watching how the animals start to lose lose condition in the next uh, month or two Okie dokie. Well, we're almost uh, down towards pile of planes. We will start searching for those cheetah and hopefully they'll be somewhere around. Thanks, Taylor. Well, the herds have continued moving on and this is the last section of it. <coughs> Excuse me. And just can you imagine this tree? This looks like a jackalberry, very stunted jackalberry has been visited by more than 30 elephants and yet it is still standing it still has foliage on it so the trees and plants in and around the water holes get an enormous amount of attention from animals that come in to drink enormous amount and yet they still seem to be quite prolific they do get hammered quite a lot and it's often you find a lot of damage on the trees in and around the watering holes but okay well while we watch those feet move through the dust and away from us James has got a bird we've got quite a special bird to see on foot can you see that oh, yeah, yeah. yeah you got in there we'll keep trying it's a woodpecker and I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's a golden-tailed woodpecker. Can you see him there? Let's just keep it. Let's keep coming round this way. While I look him up. I'm pretty sure that's what he was. He's just in this little thicket. I'm hoping he's golden tailed. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what he was. He's still there, Rex. Yeah, male golden tailed woodpecker. You got him. At the base of those two trees there. At the base there, I can hear him tapping away. Tick, 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 tick. That's quite nice to see, actually. I think my earpiece has come out. Yeah, got it. Here we go. It's quite hidden. You haven't got a press. Marvelous. Brilliant. Brilliant camel work. Golden tailed wood pacar.
and you might no you won't be able to I can just hear him going tap 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 so different from the cardinal woodpecker in that he's slightly larger and has a a uh, fully red head as opposed to a little black patch at the back of his red head. Smaller than a bearded woodpecker. And if you know your woodpeckers from around here, well, the only other one we could get really is the Bennets. Bennets is a ground-feeding woodpecker, so you wouldn't hear it going tap -ty tap 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 It also has a spotted rather than streaked front. So that's what we have there, the golden-tailed woodpecker. It's all got in there. Well, Ravinda, he's not so much well camouflaged as he is well hidden. He's just in some thickets there, and in fact that red head is particularly poorly camouflaged. You know, it's very obvious to see, for us anyway, with our colour vision. Still got him there. Yeah. That is fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. Our beard, they are not rare. But they are not commonly seen. We hear them a lot. I'll play you the call if you like. We'll see if we can get him to call to us. We just don't see them very often. Um, come on. How do I make you sing? Here we go. So they've got a very distinctive nasal call. There. I'm not going to play it again because we don't want to freak him out. You'll think it's suddenly summer again. And just looking for beetle grubs and ants, probably, whatever else he can find underneath the bark of that tree. All righty. We're going to continue. We're heading towards Beefle's Hook Waterhole, where we might find what Steve is going to show you now. Call of the African Fish Eagle. Done by me. <laughs> it's awesome. He called during the show while we were live with the elephants. We didn't know where to look. Elephants were going crazy. Fish Eagle was going crazy. I'm wondering, because we were doing a school drive, if the boys and girls thought everyone was going mad. There was so much activity going on. I didn't know where to look. When you're surrounded by elephants like that, it's very hard to know where to look from a safety point of view as well. You know, you're surrounded by really, really big animals. And then the fish eagle called, and all the distraction was off again. He's a beautiful specimen. In his favorite habitat around Chitwa watering hole. Beautifully perched. Sandra, I can't agree with you more. Absolutely beautiful. Constantly looking around. I believe that fish eagles, when they look at the water, can actually see through the mirror-like effect. You can see the movement underneath. I certainly can't. That enables them to fly at a distance and scoop up a fish. And obviously this strategy of sitting and waiting is quite energy efficient. Wait for the prey to make themselves available. And uh, talking about energy efficient, it's the hippo on the left there that has just almost dropped its baby under the water. Beautiful mother hippo. Well, I suppose hippos are rather beautiful in their own right. The baby is very cute though. He's a tiny little guy. A tiny little guy that will be here when you get back because James has found another bird. Well, yes, we have, and one of the only other few birds, or one of the few other birds that is able to dig its own hole in a tree, and that is the crested barbet, of course, and it seems to have a nest, or certainly a hole that it's been investigating on this tree. He's just come out the top of the left there. Got him there? But I'm not sure that he's going to go back towards that hole. I will show you where it was shortly. And he's actually the neatest crested barbet I've ever seen in my life. Normally, they are very scruffy. This fellow is obviously going on a date this evening. Good on you. It's 
One way to chase away the Monday blues, go on a Monday date. Yes, he's definitely meeting a lady later on at the Barbet Bar. <laughs> I think that sounds like quite a good bar to go to, the Barbet Bar. I might have to open one later on in my life. Crested cocktails, a barbed beer on tap. <laughs> Luke thinks I'll make a killing. I think Luke's being slightly sarcastic. Yes, he's definitely preened himself, really. I think he's probably got ready a little early. Don't be over keen, see? They pick that up. They can smell desperation at about a 300 paces. I'm just giving him some advice. Just go and watch TV for a little while. Read a newspaper. Just calm down. Well, I think the best person qualified to talk about smelling desperation at 300 paces uh, is probably Taylor McCurdy, because I'm sure she has smelt it herself at 300 paces. <laughs> what? <laughs> that is the most bizarre thing ever. But yes, you can't correct, James. We, us women, do have a knack for picking up the scent of desperation. It's a... Uh, so, um, so yeah, bizarre though. <laughs> Anyways, let's see what we can find around here. I'm listening to the Game Drive Radio, and it sounds like Aubrey and Taxon are hard at work trying to track down Tundi by the sounds of it. So they're checking around Chele Pan. I'm, I'm slowly moving into that area to also give them a bit of a hand. I just wanted to check for the cheetah, of course. Um, so just have a little look around here, and then we'll start turning back and heading towards, what direction is that? Northeastish. But um, nothing just yet. No cars gathering on the boundary road, no new footprints laid in the sand, nothing like that. So I think that those cheetah have extended all the way to the west in hopes to just find a decent meal. Good luck to them, though. I hope that they catch an impala, or I hope they've already caught one. And what we we'll also do is, if we don't get lucky, then we will pay those lions a visit again at some point. Wait, it's very bouncy here. Let me actually try and get hold of... Huh. Sandra, you've said that you've never seen me speechless before because of James's comment. Ha ha ha. No, there's very few times that I'm speechless. I've always got something to say. Aubrey, Aubrey for Taylor. You can quickly get hold of the guys. Orb says, there any possibility I can come and give you a hand in the area with those lap tracks? Sharing what he says. Okay. I'm going to try and listen to the game drive radio and figure out where these tracks are going while I head that way. Uh, well, off to Steve, back at Chitwa Dam. Yes, well, we are with the beautiful, beautiful light coming in from the west in the setting sun of Africa. And we are still at Chitwa Dam, the watering hole. And the little hippo is still there, away with his mom, who is very keen to stay under water for as long as possible. And we thought originally that it was, in fact, floating there on its own, which is not normally the case when it comes to hippos. <laughs> There's his little head. Don't forget, folks, this is an interactive and live game drive safari. You're welcome to send your questions and comments through. Hashtag Safari Live, or send them through on the YouTube chat. Hopefully we can answer them in, if, even if you just send your comments through. How are you doing? How was that elephant encounter for you? How nice is it to have James Hendry back? 
think I might have just broken Twitter again. Luke, I'm sorry. We didn't even get to um, have a proper chat. James got back just before, and then we were all got very quickly ready for game drive, and out we went. So I haven't even been able to catch up with him on his leave. Robin, it does look like glass. It really, really looks good. Nice and clean. It's just a gentle breeze coming in. And uh, that's why it's interesting that, that fish eagles can actually, well, apparently they can see through that that sort of mirror-like image to see exactly as glass would be underneath. Whereas us, from the angle, the refraction of the light doesn't allow us to see that. It's quite a specialized adaptation to the eye. Abigail, the hippos, when they're born, phew, I'm trying to think. I, I should know the answer to this. They are quite small in comparison to, to their counterparts, the rhinoceros. The rhinoceros um, gives birth to a more developed baby because they, can, they need to walk around, whereas the hippo gives birth to their youngster in the water, and so the weight is much less. Um, but I cannot remember the, the, the weight now. I should know. It is one of those things that has slipped my mind. But I have no doubt that there is someone out there who has been watching the show and knows the answer. See if they can get the answer in before I can find it. Oh, I might get the answer very, very quickly. So, yeah, they reckon I was going to guess somewhere around there, but I didn't guess it. Around 29 pounds. But that is a very small youngster. So babies generally weigh between 55 and 120 pounds at birth. So pretty big. But um, talking about the big hippos, our favorite hippo on the scene, Scuba Steve. Well, favourite for some, perhaps. I was hoping that over the last four weeks this fellow would have uh, developed a personality. He did briefly as we arrived. He got out of the water, stood up, grunted twice, and has reverted to his uh, naturally boring type. Now, I have not come here to talk about Scuba Steve and his lack of personality. I've come here to try and, well basically thumb my nose, if you like, at those of you who cast aspersions on me when I said to you that the Egyptian geese living here are the worst parents at Juma. I find the two Egyptian geese sitting here at Bivol's Hook Dam sans any of their children. Now, either they have grown up very quickly and disappeared and gone off somewhere else, or... These are the worst parents at Juma. There is one of them there, the other one's the other side of the waterhole, and really they have the most appalling luck, these two. If it's the same two, it could be two different ones. But I'm pretty sure it's the same two. So unfortunately, they haven't done very well at all. Apparently Steve is suggesting we write a novel called Where Have All the Goslings Gone? Well, certainly it wouldn't be a very cheerful novel, Steve, in this case. And as Luke has just pointed out to me, there will be no date night for a scuba Steve this evening. That's not Steve or War, that is this hippopotamus, uh, because unfortunately he bores his dates to death. Poor fellow. Well, uh, I, you know, it's been a long time since I've read this particular fact. Um, I think you'll probably find it's around two and a half to three years. They'll start to hit puberty. Uh, in, pro in fact, you know what? It's probably later than that. Let's think about it. The age of a hippo, or its longevity is about 35 years. So I think you'll probably find that they're tossed out of the uh, sort of matriarchal pod, if you like, or patriarchal pod, not matriarchal, around about seven or eight years. I'm guessing slightly there because I haven't read it for a very long time and my small brain can only uh, hold a certain amount of information, about one megabyte, I think that's all it's got. 
I'm going to say about eight years or so. All right, the sun's about to set, so we're going to have to turn towards home. Uh, Steve has got the one thing that we haven't seen here for a very long time. Yes, well, apparently we don't get them at before Sook Dam, but there's a good chance that they're around. You never trust a crocodile. You never, ever trust one. And this one was sauntering all the way across the watering hole here and was heading straight towards that young hippo and maybe it thought like we did it was on its own and then mum's head popped out and he started to veer off a bit to the left so what we're hoping is this crocodile is going to climb out onto the side of the bank as we so often see them in the middle of the island here at Chitwa watering hole Keys, yes, they most certainly do. Um, whether they kill hippos or not sometimes is debatable. A big hippo is very hard to kill for a crocodile. A crocodile essentially needs to, to drown it. And by drowning it, it needs to be strong enough to hold it underwater for a long period of time. But hippos are very, very strong animals. And also, uh, they don't go into the deep. So it would be very hard to, to pull a hippo under the water. Um, but they will feed on dead hippos. Hippos do kill themselves from time to time while fighting. And crocodiles will always dispatch of that, the remains of a dead hippo in the water. But I've never seen a crocodile attempt uh, a hippo, purely because the mother will just chop them in half very, very quickly. So it's kind of like a mutual, like, you stay away from my baby and I won't chop you in half. It seems like a, a bit of a win-win for both. Don't you think sends? Well, that's a, a, probably a, a, a no to your question. Um, just like most animals, babies don't generally do very well without their mum. That's mum that uh, protects them, mum that feeds them through milk, and mum that obviously keeps the lions at bay, hyenas at bay. So Archer, an animal without a mother, doesn't normally do very well. It's just the way it works, just like a human child. Um, you know, we're the only population or only species, I think, of that takes in foster children. There are certain individuals that will take in, certain species will take in a, another animal for a period of time, but not for very long. Elephants are probably one that might, but um, you know, maybe a baby elephant would survive in a herd purely because of the relationship. But in a part of hippos, I doubt, I doubt it would happen. But the chances of that female being killed are very slight. I mean, if she died of old age, then she probably shouldn't be having a young baby. Um, but if lions killed her, well, then that is one of those very unnatural things that happen. And uh, shame. If they did kill her, they'd probably kill the baby first because lions will select the easiest. And... I know who I'd choose if I wanted to fight those two over there. Don't you sense? Oh, well, now that they've both gone under the water. Okay, well, we're going to move on to another viewpoint. And James Hendry is on his way home in the African bush. I believe that Steve has a challenge known as how many buffalo thorn leaves can you eat in one minute uh, using your hands. And I think he did 20. He did 20. Yeah, but Taylor did, I can't remember. But Taylor did more, did she? Yeah, I think she beat him, yes. She but beat him. Remember. All right, well, shall we try that game? Ooh. Taylor did not eat 97 leaves in well, one. Did she really? That's quite something. All right, here we go. Without her hands. That's very funny, Luke. That's very amusing. Look at me laughing. That smile, the face, laughing. Okay, here we go. And go. Ah, 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 six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I will. Twelve, thirteen. Do I have to swallow them? Fourteen, fifteen. Go, go, go. Oh, I'm doing. I'm doing. Twenty seconds. Nineteen. Twenty. One. Twenty-two. One. Three. Four. Thirty seconds. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. 
and nine, and eight, and one, and two, and three, and four. Have I got anything in my teeth? <laughs> yes. Have I? 36. Wow. What did you say I do? Really? Are you sure I've got something in my teeth? <laughs> no, it's okay. No, good. is it okay? It okay, good, good, thanks. All right, <laughs> uh, Luke, so what did Taylor get? Could be, this could become quite a funny... It actually tastes very good. For those of you who have never seen Zizifus mucronata or the buffalo thorn eaten before, um, it tastes really nice. It's like a sort of really flavorful spinach, actually. Not offensive at all. Um, certainly, I would happily eat that on a salad. <laughs> Taylor says the challenge is on, apparently. She's going to go for 55. Well, I think you have to find a better bush than I did there. I'm going to blame the bush. I've got a couple of holes in my hand. Anyway, there we go. It was quite good. So, yes, we are on our way home. We've just left the Biffles Hook water hole. Uh, there were some tundy tracks in this area, so we'll have a quick look on our way. Right, Taylor is now about to take up the challenge of the Zizifus eating competition. Go. Terribly sorry, folks. I think James overdid his leaf consumption and zips the bush back, bush walk backpack to sh down. We do apologize for that. These are things that happen out in the wilderness when you're walking very far from the actual radio or signal repeater with something on your head or on your back. So I do apologize for his signal breakup. We have decided to leave. Yes, Chitwa watching hole, that Franklin disagreed. So folks, I was going to move my medicinal Mondays to this afternoon, but it just doesn't work in the afternoon. So I'm going to do it in the morning on my bushwalk tomorrow. So if I've disappointed anyone, I do humbly apologize. This morning just didn't work out. There was just too much going on. And that is what happens, you know, too much going on. I know a lot of you like to see the animals. So to stop and do a plant segment when there's a lion in the bush. Well, we need to reconsider and think about that. So, hence we didn't do it this morning, but we will reconvene. Well, the elephants also, they threw a spanner in my works there. It's getting just a little bit sort of, it'll be a bit dark soon. It just won't work as well. In the afternoon, I don't know, it just, just doesn't seem to fit. So I do apologize if those of you out there were dying to see it this morning. I was very keen to show you. Got a red-billed hornbill doing his little dance. It's just here, just here in the jackalberry that's managed to evade the elephant feeding. That is a very tall jackalberry. I don't think the other one. Whoa, there he goes. Nice flying shot. Oh, he's got a friend on the floor, Sens, that had a lot of things in his beak. He was picking up all sorts. He's got some. You can just see him. Just see him here. He's got stuff in his beak. Very, very, very good with their beak. You might not be able to see too clearly. There is a red-billed hornbill. And what are you eating? I don't know. Looks like a little bit of leaf, actually. It's maybe a present. Like, let's. We're going to breed late this year, and he has a bit of. He has a little bit of nesting material for you. His own. Luke says he's doing his own medicinal Monday. Well, indeed. Maybe they're looking for a partner. A little bit early in the season, chaps. Let's just finish the breeding season. <laughs> Such funny animals. <laughs> I believe you can all hear them chirping away here. Possibly a young one that's learning. Oh, 
can you just just the I'm just going to move forward half a centimeter and we were going to get the light how's that sense go 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 Okay, it's almost like it's a young hornbill that's fledged this season and it's like, okay, well, when I meet my girlfriend one day, this is what I'm going to give her, right? And the others are going, yes, yes, just like that, a piece of leaf, a little bit of grass material, that's going to go in the nest. He's like, really? She's going to like me because of this? Because of this leaf in my mouth? Yes, son, yes, son, she will. And your eyelashes, of course. <laughs> There's an adult over there, it looks a bit bigger. Talking them through the Valentine's Day discussions. Ravinda, well, you want to know how many hornbill species? The southern ground hornbill, definitely. The southern red bill hornbill, which is this one. The southern yellow. Uh, the, the gray, African gray hornbill, so that's four. And then I've seen the trumpeter. Uh, they don't really stick around. And you could probably also get the crowned moving through, although I've never seen one in this area. But I've definitely heard and seen a trumpet to fly through. So that's definitely four, potentially five. And I think it would be quite a hard ask to say six. And it's all about habitat preference. The trumpeter and the, the crowned hornbill, not the ground, the crowned, like much more sort of uh, riverine habitat, tall trees. They're very, very fruit-eating birds. And they're like big canopies, um, so very, very major river sources that move through the reserves that have a lot of water, a lot of vegetation, a lot of moisture. That is what they like. Okay, so we're going to move on here. I left our hornbills. We're going to go back onto Juma for an afternoon leopard. We've had a wonderful time at Chitwa. Okay, and while we move back over to Juma, not quite yet, still seems to be some technical difficulties on the other side. You'll stay with us, but that's okay. That's okay, we'll be going over to Juma in the next minute and we'll see you on the other side. We're here with one of the last green trees at Juma, and that, of course, is the jackalberry. And it is not an evergreen, as I've told many of you before. It is deciduous, but it uses, loses its leaves at odd times of the year. And, of course, that is possible out here because of the fact that it never gets that cold, so the trees don't have to go dormant. So it'll probably lose its leaves right at the very end of the winter. So it'll be gathering resources as we speak in its root system, uh, using the lack of competition from other trees at this time of the year uh, to its own benefit. So that is Diospyrus mespeloformes. What a wonderful name for a tree. Yes. Uh, there was something else I wanted to say about that. Oh, yes. The first time I realised there were trees like this, of course, I was sitting uh, at Kenton-on-Sea, where my mother and father now reside, and we have a tree there called a fiddlewood, which I think is a South American species. It's not a South African or African species. And it loses its leaves at Christmas time, which, of course, is very odd. Uh, but it must be a forest tree uh, wherever it comes from. I think it's South America. And so it very cleverly loses its leaves when everyone else is fighting for, fighting for light. And then when everyone else has no leaves, it has beautiful leaves. So that is the fiddlewood as well as the Diospyrus mespeloformes. What is this thing? It is a spider. Mina Moo, you say, what did I think about the ocean? Well, I, it was quite salty. <laughs> uh, the mm, ocean was pretty salty. Can you see the spider? <laughs> Mina Moo, it was, it was magic. It was absolute magic to be under the sea, uh, not singing, uh, whatever that song is, but it was really spectacular to be in a new wilderness, and I didn't think I'd enjoy it, to be honest. I thought I'd find it quite claustrophobic, but I found it quite the opposite. I found it totally freeing. No, I think it's gone. 
It's a hunting spider of some sort. Uh, so, Minamu, yeah, I, I will definitely be doing some more diving. It was very special, and I think, you know, where we were in Grand Cayman, a really perfect place to learn to dive. Perhaps not, it's not the most diverse diving in the world, I'm told. I mean, I thought it was perfectly diverse enough for my needs. Uh, but apparently, one of the easiest places to learn to dive, because there was no current, it was warm, sort of 82 degrees Fahrenheit every day, 28 degrees, that's in the water and we could dive off the shore. I get dreadfully seasick, so I, I wouldn't like going on a boat too much. Uh, so it was really the most perfect place to learn. And of course I had a magnificent instructress, and that was Simone, who's unfortunately had to go back to Australia for the next little while. So it was very special, and to see all those creatures there living their lives and wonder, uh, sort of project onto them what I thought about the wilderness out here, was just very interesting. It's obviously completely different, and, uh, well, there's still so much to learn about the ocean, isn't there? All righty. I, I, I don't know the answer to this question. Is Steve a scuba himself? Scuba me. What's the question? I didn't hear the question. I'll try answer it if I can. Indeed, I have an answer. In 2004, I worked on a boat in Australia. I was the cook. Yes, I can cook. And um, I got my diving qualifications sorted out while I was there. But the problem was that um, the final paperwork didn't get signed off. I got about 30 dives or so because we used to do a sail and dive off of the boat so I used to cook the food and then every day so maybe six times a week I'd get to dive I did that for a couple months I got a number of dives under my belt and uh, the, something happened with the company and the person who signed me off and it just all went bottoms up into the deep should we say and we've got a little couple of talks here and then I did do some diving in, in New Zealand as well. That was very different. But I was in the, the lower barrier reef in uh, the Whitsunday Islands in Australia. It was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful marine protected areas there. Don't say Okamori's name out loud. The Wartox don't like it. And yeah, the water was warm, but there were also box jellyfish there that had potentially were able to kill you. I never saw one. They made a, a lot of money out of marketing the suits you needed to wear to protect yourself from these box jellyfish. Let's move forward, since. Okay, well, we're going to leave these warthogs in the golden light, and I believe the lioness herself, with her mane of hair, has found her own cats. I'm so excited, I cannot even tell you. Our wishes came true this afternoon and the cheetah decided to come back this way for now. We're still seeing they're on the boundary road at the moment. No, turn right, go right, go right. Now, there was a big herd of impala that walked along the road in front of her and uh, they've gone into into our property, so into Vuyatela. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully, hopefully she'll just keep going and she'll end up coming this way I mean that's going to be ideal but unfortunately she's causing a quite a bit of traffic today because there's just vehicle after vehicle after vehicle uh, all over and civilian vehicles all trying to obviously make the gate in time <laughs> how's that excuse I'm so sorry I'm late you know there was a cheetah on the road uh, a pretty a pretty pretty good ex um, reason if you if you ask me I don't know where the youngsters are I'm sure they're around Let's just see what mom does. Oh no, girl, come back north. Remember I told you about those impala earlier this morning and now there's another herd that's on on our side and we, she was watching them walk across the road and the impala didn't even know that she was there. And I think the reason why she maybe didn't chase them, I don't know how much grip she would have running on the road, even though it is a dirt road. I, I don't think she'll be getting much traction. It, it's it's very hard. It's almost concrete-like, if you will. So even with those nails um, 
that are very, very tough, more like a dog's nail, I don't think that they would work very well. However, she's running on the grass and things like that. Um, that, of course, is going to, uh, to be the absolute best, and those claws can really dig into the grass and help propel her forward. Tracy, she is absolutely beautiful. Stunning. Okay, now she's just crossed off the property, but that doesn't mean that she she won't stay there. I think we're going to get a civilian vehicle creeping into our shot in five, four, three. No, maybe I should have I should have gone ten, nine. <laughs> anyway, there is a vehicle creeping towards them. Uh, we'll just be patient, and uh, I think well, Steve is also being patient with all the animals today. With the smallest carnivore in the savannah, Mam mammalian anyway, the dwarf mongoose. And it was so interesting, folks, we just saw this small troop of dwarf mongoose run up onto the termite mound and two squirrels bounded up and joined them. We had a look at them grooming themselves and a little sort of scratch on top themselves and then disappeared. I've never seen squirrels interacting at this level with the mongoose without any sort of repercussions, which goes to show, I mean, I was asked a few weeks ago a question of do they compete? And by the fact that um, they just sort of hung out together, I don't think there's any real competition. The, the squirrel doesn't do too much digging. The mongoose is able to dig and got a little bit more of a carnivory, omnivory type of diet, whereas the squirrel is exclusively sort of nuts and seeds, a little bit of vegetation. And they have probably found themselves their way back to their nightly slumber. Gizmo, these are very cute guys. And uh, before they go to bed, they will do a little bit of grooming of themselves and obviously a little bit amongst themselves. One at a time, they'll slowly disappear into the, the beautiful habitats provided by the termites in that big mound. Excuse me. Well, we've come in on the on the eastern side to see what it is we might be able to see. But before they run away, let's quickly go back to those fast cats. Like I said, she's still causing an absolute traffic jam at the moment, but the animals come first out here in the game reserve. She's just laying up in the sand now. And I'm sure that is nice and warm on her belly and on her feet. She hasn't quite decided what she's going to do. I think she's probably feeling a little bit on the frustrated side as to she's probably been up and moving around and trying to find something to eat. And, well, the food is just taunting her. It's right there in front of her, which is quite cool. So now she just needs to decide where she's going to go. Is she going to go and follow the herd of impala that has crossed onto the property or is she going to wait for somebody else to come uh, into this area? They're not too far away from a uh, from a nice big open clearing, actually on either side. I think they've come from Knobthorn Open, which is on Arethusa, and that's a lovely open spot too. It's kind of, it's a bit bigger than I would say impala plains in total. And then, then of course they've got impala plains too. And they've got that going for them. Uh, they can head around there. And then that's sort of a semi-open area extending to the north towards um, uh, Sandy Patch. Uh, uh, Gemma, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how tall she is, but she's um, they're not small creatures in terms of height. They definitely seem to be taller than leopards. I would say, I'm going to guess, oh, I've got a mammal's book. I can actually tell you exactly what their height is. I'm going to say she probably stands just over a meter tall. Let me get my mammals book. Let's see if they've got height. About it. I stand under correction. I'm just, of course, busking, but I will get you the real information in a minute. I like to play the guessing game. It's um, quite cool to sort of see where you are. Wait, where have we got to go? 278. Oh, perfect. We're right there. Let's see. Okay, so length. Oh, height is actually just under that. So they're saying here about uh, males up to about 87 centimeters in sort of height, so maybe females will just be less than that. So 87 centimeters, so 100 centimeters will be a meter, so actually just a little bit less than that. She just looked so big the way she was standing. And shall we check what a leopard is? Because I'm pretty sure they're tall. 282, so we don't have to scroll too much. 
Very cool. Where's the we'll go? Right here. Let's quickly just check the height of a of a male leopard. For some bizarre reason. I can't get that. I can't get the height now. Anyways, I'll keep on looking. Anyway, right. Keep your fingers crossed that she does cross north. Right, off to go to James. And James, I promise I'll get to that buffalo thorn leaf picking competition in a minute. I think the cheetah are probably slightly more entertaining than watching Ted and I eat buffalo uh, thorn leaves. Anyway, uh, what we have here is quite an interesting little forensic uh, analysis. We've got an enormous raisin bush leaf. This is, of course, the sandpaper raisin. Uh, not so interesting because it's a sandpaper raisin, but because, of course, there's a whole lot of white dung on it. And if you look around here, you can see that it has been spattered with white dung. Now that tells me that a bird has been either sitting in the raisin bush or there is perhaps a nest in the knobthorn tree above. Now we know that knobthorn trees form quite nice holes for hole nesting birds like barbets and starlings and woodpeckers and lilac breasted rollers and woodland kingfishers and hoopoos and that sort of thing. And so my suspicion, given that I'm not sure how much fruit this tree has borne this year, is that there was a nest not too high above us that begat a whole lot of little baby birds that, uh, well, relieved themselves, not to put too fine a point in it, on this raisin bush. And the white bit that you can see is the uric acid that has remained. Well, as... <laughs> As Luke points out, he says, it could also have been miniature climbing hyenas. Well, yes, it could have, Luke. I haven't seen miniature climbing hyenas out here for some time, however. So I don't think it was miniature climbing hyenas. I think it was defecating bird chicks. Miniature climbing hyenas. I think we should go somewhere other than here. Why has James, or what has James said to make Luke laugh so much? It was James, was it not? Luke? Giggling in my ear? That is funny. <laughs> that is funny. Apart from the fact that hyenas, just even if they were miniature, wouldn't be climbing, really, would they? Sure. <laughs> okay, well, we are officially back on Mvuyatela, Juma, and we're going to head back down, sort of central, through the middle parts. Ooh, have we got something on the nest there? We do. We've got a little head on top there. It is a beautiful time of day. That is the African hawk eagle nest. It looks like there's a head. If it's a, a female that is nesting. Or if it's a youngster. Can't really see the coloration. And I think it's probably one of the adults on the on the eggs. Is that a stick, Senzo? <laughs> Senzo, thank you. You only took 30 seconds to tell me that it's a stick. Uh, apparently, folks, we've just been looking at a stick. Okay, so Rexon's calling me. Standing by. Covid, I'm on my way. Just come on to Central from uh, Drakensburg. So, Tex, Rexon is very likely found possibly Tundi. We're not sure. Hold on, Senza. It does get a bit bumpy down this little road. And we are right here. He's at the bottom of this drainage. 
and he's got very first tracks and Nyala are barking. Whoa. Oh. Oh. Just like that. And uh, this is exactly the road we followed the sticks out last night. Heading that direction, east to Torchwood. And uh, we are quite excited because I said to Sen, let's go find ourselves a leopard. And um, well, Rexon will probably find the leopard and we'll just help him. Oh. Okay, beautiful in the light. Beautiful in the afternoon light. Sorry that I am just paying attention here. I don't want to uh, drive past Rexon, who's probably right in front of me now. Okay, well, while we try to find Rexon and these barking Nyala, let's go to final words from James Henry for the afternoon. Well, we have found the barking Nyala. Have you got them there? They're just across this drainage system here, looking down towards the drainage. Um, Lucas, you can tell Steve Ovo that we're on Nyala Road South, They're looking straight into the drainage system here. It's going to be a little bit of a bumpy walk. Let's see if we can get a view. This will be perfect if we can get a look across this drainage line. Where is she? Steve's coming this way. Rexon's gone straight down into the drainage line. Can you hear that? I don't know if you can hear it. It's a loud noise. Oh, oh! Yes, Ravinda, I'm pretty sure that it's Tundi we're going to get. It's definitely Tundi that's causing this problem. Her tracks have been all over here. So, Steve, we're on the western side. Now we're now in the drainage. Steve's going to go along the eastern bank. Now, of course, these things will keep on calling for a little while after they've seen the leopard. And so, she may well have moved along here. She could, of course, be hearing us and watching us at the same time. There she is, baby, baby leopard. There's Talamba. Talamba's just through there, straight over the top of Rexon's head. Come over here. She's just through here. We might get a view. There. Yeah. I can't see her. Can you still see her? Rex says, keep going. You just want to kind of pretend we're walking past. She'll be in those thickets there on that little termite mound. Now, if that was the mum, we'd follow up, but we're not going to follow the little cub. Can you see her? Is it the rest to that log there? She's just at that log. Let's just see if we can't get a quick view of her. I'm looking with my binoculars. Greg says it's worth just carrying on around the corner here. We might get a view. She'll be hiding. She'll be watching us. Oh, that's wonderful. That's so special for your baby leopard. On foot, first day back. So lucky. So that is Tlalamba, aged now. How old is she? She was born in February, I think, was she? Was it February? Oh, goodness, no, it was January. No, it wasn't January, it was November. Okay, we got it, we got it, we got it. Come, 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 sit, sit. Quickly. She's just over, straight through this bush here. Straight through. Can you see the ears? I've got her. Can you see the ears there? If you come over here. You just see the ears straight through the top there. Yeah. So if, if you look through, 
If you look through the... Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, you got yeah, it. I see, I see. There we got it now. So that's little Tlalamba, born in November, sorry. November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. Goodness gracious me, she's almost eight months old. Well done, Rex, that's brilliant. How fantastic is that now? We just need to get Steve in here. Well, thank you very much, all of you saying, go Rex, go James. It's definitely got nothing to do with James. James is simply following. And thanks, of course, to the Nyala. Ah, oh, brilliant. So Steve should be coming along the eastern bank now. I can't hear him. But I'm pretty sure that Tandi must be around here as well. We'll stay with Tlalamba, and as soon as Seb's arms get too tired, then we'll go across to, to Taylor, but otherwise we'll stay here. So, Seb, you just let me know as and when your biceps become too exhausted. There we go. <laughs> just see the little ears. And for those of you who are perhaps new viewers, female cub, eight months old, so heading towards the sub-adult stage, I suppose. And she was born on her own, we think. We didn't, didn't see any other cubs. And we've known her since she was, well, about the size of a um, chihuahua, I suppose. Isn't that special? Now she's looking up, of course, towards the sound of Steve's vehicle coming along. Thank you, Joy. You say you arranged this for me as a welcome back gift. It's a brilliant welcome back gift. Thank you very, very much indeed. Oh, look at her. We're not going to hang her. We're not going to go any closer than this. So if she moves away, well, that's just going to be it. All right, we're going to leave her. Hopefully Steve will get in here and have a good look. In the meantime, Taylor's luck continues to be fairly magnificent. I know, it's about time. Look who we've got. A hyena that is here with the cheetah. Now, it's not unusual to see a hyena following other predators around. They're, they're actually very clever by using this tactic it's actually copying the cheetah the cheetah have just sat down and so is the hyena and i think that's what that hyena is going to do is it's just going to continue to hang around here and then follow the cheetah for the rest of the evening now mom is aware and so are both youngsters that there is a hyena you can see that's what she's looking at at the moment she's not paying any attention to us now i don't think that they would get into a fight with one another while there isn't any food around because a hyena doesn't want to get injured and trust me even though cheetahs are not the biggest and strongest cats those claws not sharp like a lion's claw but you can imagine if they strike you have you ever seen how they sort of chop forward that would definitely um open the skin so a cheetah uh, lion blah, 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 blah. i'm getting too excited now a hyena would not want to um engage in something like that and then of course mom Cheetah over here will be worried about her youngster, so she's going to be on the uh, sort of more defensive bat anyway, and that means that she'll probably run away. But it's no good for her because we know that she's been wanting to look for something to eat. And Ferg actually spotted that hyena maybe about 10 minutes ago, almost when we first arrived with the cheetah. So it's been following them, and I think it's just going to continue following them right through in hope that they make a kill. And then the hyena, who's bigger and stronger, can just come through and bash its way in and take it. Robin, you've said that the hyenas are such sinister characters. They are, but they're efficient. They're so clever. There's absolutely no doubt uh, that hyenas are one of the more uh, in intelligent mammals out here. And um, the fact that the, that the hyena is going to be patient enough to just follow the cheetah around is pretty spectacular. Right, now how exciting. We've gone with, from lions to cheetah, back to leopards. Well, indeed, thank you so much, James and Rex and the Bushwalk team. You can't see too much of her, but there's her tail. I'm going to give her as much space as she needs. 
And this is pretty much exactly where we were last night with the sticks pride. So she's probably been hiding in and around these little thickets and it's probably had a little bit of a worrisome night if mum hasn't been back to see her. But that is what leopard cubs do. They stay very still. They be very quiet while mum's away. There she is. Isn't she beautiful? Look at that camouflage. If it wasn't for the upturned tail, folks, you wouldn't know that she's there, would you? So she's quite relaxed. No doubt it's a, quite an in, endeavour for her to see James on foot. <laughs> Rather exciting for everybody indeed. And she's looking off in the distance that they're walking away. That is the benefit of being on foot with these cats or for tracks is to be able to find them. To be able to find a cat like this or an adult even without being on foot is very, very difficult. Consider it took him quite a while just to call us into the area where they were. So to randomly find that while driving, they have to be in the road. There is the beautiful little Tlalamba. And she's wondering, Mum, where is my dinner? Ali, that's a really good question. I mean, I honestly haven't spent too much time myself with, with leopard cubs. It's quite a new thing for me. Um, but I'm sure she could hunt little scrub hares. She could probably hunt a few, few small things, maybe a bird or two, maybe some mice, a squirrel. I think she could successfully hunt some of them now, but not, not all the time. I think she'd have quite a, a good effort. She'd probably miss lots, but for her to be hunting anything bigger than that, I think it will take some time still. Keeps to the small, um, gentle stuff that doesn't really hurt you. Um, she will upgrade at some stage to a day cap, but I think that might be some time. I think there was footage of Hosanna at about eight and nine months. Was a monitor lizard. I'm not sure exactly how old he was then, but he caught a monitor lizard. But they're not as fast as leopards, and he was looked very chuffed with his prize that he didn't share with anybody. I was just looking at that clip we had on a little while ago. I wasn't here during those times. Y yes, she is, Raj, and Mom hasn't left her with any toys to play with, apart from her own tail. And she knows her job is to sit very quietly, to be very alert, and no doubt she will scamper up a tree if anything pressing comes near, or she'll dash into the bush just behind her there nice and protected from anything I imagine if I'd stopped to do my medicinal talk this afternoon since we'd never would have been in the right place would we have and that that is the way it is How invisible is she? How did they see her? Angie, that's a very good question. That is a very, very good question. I honestly don't know the answer to that. Um, maybe James has got a bit more experience with leopard cubs and in the documentation that they've been doing here of all the youngsters. I think Hosanna and Shungili were a year when um, Karula passed and they managed to, to come through it all. So. It is a very interesting question. I know it adds all sorts of drama and ifs and buts to everybody, but it's part and parcel of what goes on out here in the African wilderness, you know. Animals live and die and uh, they survive or they don't. That's just the way it works. Sometimes it's hard to think about, but I think she's doing quite well. Tundi's a very good mum. What's going to happen to Tundi? Nothing's going to happen to her just yet. She is still doing very, very well and very strong. And um, the tracks apparently were around Chelapan, so it's possibly uh, she was the second female because the tracks that I had people following, that we were following, I think were a bit older. Not very old, but 
they weren't the same tracks that scared those baboons. So we reckon it was probably Tandy that scared those baboons. But we're going to probably move off from this little youngster soon to give her some space. But while we do that, let's go to Taylor and her cats. We've still got the cheetah. And this female was, was quite nervous at one point, not because of us, not because of the hyena, but because there were some birds alarming from behind us. And and she was focused. She, she's still just checking off to the right, so sort of to the west of us. Now, there could be another predator around. It's gone all very quiet and very eerie at the moment. There's really not a sound, not a bird to be heard. So she's just going to watch. But I really think that the fact that this hyena is around now, they're not going to try and do any hunting whatsoever. I feel like she knows that if she, she's going to do all the hard work of bringing something down and that hyena will just come in and steal it straight away and then also call in for reinforcements to come and feed most likely. So I think she's going to cut her losses and just sort of rest it out until that hyena gets bored and then moves off. Oh, I'm just calling... I see Graham. I'm trying to get attention of people on the road. Okay, they've seen me. Perfect. Sorry, everybody, about that whistle. But like I said, out here in nature, you can do a whistle or something like that, and the animals don't seem to mind it because the birds are chirpy. But, uh, oh, dear, that was a very loud whistle. But um, I, I can't get hold of the guys on the radio, and there's two people that are wanting to come in, and they weren't responding. So I just thought a whistle would be work. And they, had, they, they all stopped dead in their tracks now, and now they're coming in. So that kind of worked. <laughs> Very well. Ferg, if I was whistling at you, it would have been a... <laughs> <laughs> ah, right, so for those of you who know, we're one big happy family here. We often tease, or we tease each other on a regular basis. Ah, very funny. But anyways, it seems as though Klalamba is up again and she's moving around. Yes, well, she looks like she's stalking something. Or she spotted mum. We're not quite sure. Hard to tell. She stalks mum all the time. She's very interested in her environment. See how gently she walks. Very important. These skills that they practice trying to catch birds and, and terrorizing Franklins so that eventually she's able to be very stealthy and successful like her mother. Look at that beautiful walk. What are you looking at, young lady? We're going to just stay with her for this last minute or two. If Tandy doesn't arrive, we're going to leave her to, to her refuge here in the drainage line. I think she's hoping Mum's going to return soon with some food. She seems to have spotted something, doesn't she? Paula, she is very cute. It is very cute seeing her. I've been very privileged in my time. I've seen her a lot since January. It's been pretty quiet the last month or so, for me anyway, seeing her. Tundies keeps leaving her very far away. Or when you do see her, she's in the long grass feeding on a dacre. Oh, did you say dacre, Steve? She quite likes the taste of dacre. Her mom's favourite meal. I hope you all got your screenshot there for your daily dose of cuteness. Senzo and I have had the most remarkable afternoon, starting with those elephant. And now Rexon and James finding this beautiful, beautiful young leopard. And uh, we are going to leave her very soon to do her thing for the night as the sun has set in the east, or in the west, <laughs> in the east. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still coughing a bit. My lungs are sore after Steph 
decided to join us on our sprints this afternoon and nearly killed me. I suppose that's what ego does to you. Ego will kill you one day. Hey, baby, yes, she is growing at a remarkable rate. Really is. And uh, her cuteness remains, though. Okay, well, folks, we're going to be leaving Tlalamba here by herself. Uh, no sign of Tandi. We don't want to influence anything at all. So we're going to leave before it gets dark. And let's, while we're leaving, we're going to go over to Taylor with some cats. She's also not going to see when it gets dark. So these are the two youngsters that are now just sitting in the grass. We have managed to reposition our, our way around and they look very, very comfortable in um, all that brown, dry grass. I couldn't imagine laying there. I think I would be very, very itchy. And that was me and I'd break out in all sorts of welts. But um, like I said, doesn't they're not showing much sign of moving around at all. That wouldn't surprise me if they didn't move too much further tonight. Perhaps we'll find them in exactly the same spot tomorrow morning can only hope um, that they'd be around all those sort of uh, warthog burrows where Hukumori seems to like to catch them. Just listening around. Now, every now and then, if you do hear a fan, I just want to point it out. Um, obviously, with our awesome new uh, FLIR thermal camera, you can imagine um, there's all sorts of things that we need to be able to use that as well. So we've just got an there's an extra fan going, so you might hear that slight sort of hum. So don't don't be alarmed. Well, not, not that I think you'd be worried, but um, if you're wondering if it's coming from your side, it isn't. It's actually coming from the car. Yeah, I think that they're going to tuck themselves in and end up resting about. I really hope that they do stay this side and decide to fen uh, venture more north. That is going to be the best spot for them to find a, a meal. Um, so, Emily, typically a cheetah, we were just talking about, I, I'm st I can't find the height in my mammal's book of a leopard, but I'm pretty sure that at shoulder height, a cheetah will be taller than a leopard. Maybe not by much, but they're definitely taller. And then, of course, leopards outweigh cheetah. So, they're, I mean, they're, they're obviously um, a little bit uh, different. So, for instance, that female cheetah, she maybe weighs probably between... I don't know, I'd say between 35 and 45 kilograms, maybe somewhere around there. And then a big male cheetah can weigh up to about 60 kilograms, but normally not more than that. Ah, there we go. Thanks, Luke has just said the leopard's height, and this is shoulder height, is, is 50 to uh, 75 centimeters, whereas with cheetah, the shoulder height is anywhere, um, um, I suppose, between about 70 centimeters, and I think I read up to about 90 something centimeters um, for the males, too. So much taller, but again, cannot compete in terms of the power. Um, cheetah is super, super streamlined. I mean, a big male leopard, for example, if we look at the Anderson male, who is um, exceptional, he weighs well over 90 kilograms, so more than double uh, the weight of that female cheetah. And they don't, like we were talking about it this morning, they don't need to be big and bulky. The idea is to not try and pull prey down. They're hunting smaller prey species. They, I don't think a cheetah really would want to have the burden of sitting with a kill for two or three days. Uh, and, you know, uh, they're basically just sitting ducks in. They eat as much as they can. Hopefully they can finish the carcass and then they get up and they move off. And often they don't even get to finish their food because they'll have something like a hyena come through and chase them off. And like I've said, I've even seen big groups of vulture chase single cheetah off of their kills. Uh, I can't tell you how many times that that happens. A cheetah will go out, catch an impala on its own, start feeding, and next minute vultures fly on in, you know, 30 or 40 of them, and, and will chase it right off. So it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. So you can understand why that the cheetah female has now gone, right, everybody, let's catch up on some sleep. Let's just relax. And until that hyena or any other predators that might be following them in the area move off, I don't think that they will do much. They'll just lay low and try and stay sort of out of sight. This is awesome, though. I'm really enjoying spending time with these two youngsters. It's, um, it's very, very special, very special. They're so playful. But I still have yet to see tiny little cheetah cubs. One day. Can't see it all, hey? Abigail, no, they're not considered any, any less um, uh, sort of cats 
and I suppose because of their features, they do seem more dog-like, don't they? But um, but no, they are indeed felines. Um, so there's there's no difference sort of there. And sh again, they're just built for different things. They're hunting in a different way. Can you imagine if cheetah also had to stalk their prey and and get as close as possible to it before hunting it like lions and leopards do? There's just so much competition. I think it's awesome. Uh, the way that cheetah have adapted differently and make use of speed. It's very cool. They are such amazing creatures. To be honest, they, they've never been a huge favorite of mine, the cheetah, and I think that's because I, I never got to spend a lot of time with them when I first started guiding. But the more and more I spend with these cats, uh, it's, it's truly amazing to see the relationship that they, they do have with their mothers. It's very different, I find. I don't know, from a leopards to, to lions. And the the adult, well, the female cheetah, she seems to be, she's so tolerant of her youngsters. I mean, how many times did they bulldoze over her? And she didn't even snarl. Whereas we'll sit with leopards and lions, and they're very quick to growl and snarl and swipe at their youngsters, almost reprimand them. Um, maybe I've just been lucky, maybe but I've just seen very tolerant cheetah mothers. But they always seem to be willing to play a bit of a game, and then they don't mind if they get run over every now and then. Yeah, going fast asleep. I don't think we'll stay here too much longer because it is getting a little bit dark. And and um, what was I going to say now? And I think they are going to sleep. If they're on the move, I would have maybe followed them. But I think just because they're going to probably just rest here, we, we will just let them go. Um, Oregon, sure. It, you know, I suppose it depends on how fast or how much energy they used within that hunt, you know. If if they do successfully take something down, I would imagine they, again, if it was, a say, something like a baby impala and only a couple of weeks old or even just a few months old, it's not going to be a particularly difficult thing. You know, they're very inexperienced and they often make a mistake. Not that they're not fast enough to run away, but um, they panic and then they might not run in one direction. They might stop and try and change direction. And then that, of course, um, could end up in the cheetah catching them fairly quickly. So I think it just depends on how much energy they're using. But if they do do a hunt and they've dashed 300 meters across an open area, they're going to be fairly tired and they're going to need to rest for a little while um, before they can get up again and move on. But um, again, that would vary from cheetah to cheetah. Some might have a better recovery than others and some might take a little bit longer. See, I don't know what that youngster's got up to have a look at. Oh, well, she, that little one seems to be a little bit wary, but I don't see mom standing up and sibling is laying flat on the floor. Jason, they were, everyone suspects that they were born in about October, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. So, yeah, eight months, eight going on nine months, somewhere around there. So... Not quite at independence age just yet, but um, it can be anywhere between 14 and 18 months old and that they will head on off. But I think we're going to go. I think we're going to try and make our way out of the sighting now. Like I said, they, I think they've had enough of the vehicles today and we might as well... Wonderful. We're going to move on off of this, but it was great afternoon with the, uh, with the cheetah. And I hope you all enjoyed it. Let's go see where Steve is. Wow. Well, the words for this afternoon are, wow, we've had such a nice time. It's beautiful to be out here in the African wilderness and elephants. I didn't think we could top the elephants this afternoon. And seeing Clalumba is, is a very, very high on the list there. The elephants were still very, very special. But we left her and her parting pose was she put her face on her on her head like that. And she looked very where's mommy? Where's my dinner? She's probably just waiting all day, listening to every sound that moves. Just looking and looking and looking. Very cute. Very very cute. So Jess, yeah, what you say there is, is, is pretty much what is, is in the book. And what happens is that female leopards kind of share or move into a part of their 
their mother's territory. So that is generally what happens from a from a standard point of view. Um, it's not often that the females move off, but then like the Shadulu female has moved into this area. So it's not always how it works. So they do move from other places. What is that? Oh, we've got some impala over here. I thought our luck for more cats. Well, it's a, that's a Nyala. I must be going blind. These are probably the animals that alerted Rexon to the presence of that youngster. Because they would basically have seen a youngster and it doesn't matter. A leopard is a leopard to them. And they react to it and uh, bark. Well, I'm not going to do the bark now. In case I'll scare them off. Very nice, Rob. As we watch the Nyala disappear into the bushes, we're going to make our way back to the Avoca males and see if they've mainly, maybe managed to wake themselves up after their daily slumber. So yes, the leopard territory story is, uh, is an interesting one, and I don't think it's a fixed thing that every female says, okay, well, I'm going to leave this piece of land for my youngster. I think it's something that does happen, but sometimes, uh, you know, you get a young female who has her first, her first cubs, she has two of them, perhaps. There's only so much space you can give up for females, so if, invariably females will have to move, but they do stay quite close by, maybe the territory next door or the one after that. But males, uh, they're not really tolerated in the natal area and they get pushed away purely because of their competitive edge and they need to maybe start mating with the females and from a genetic point of view that's not ideal okay well we're going to be going to IR very soon Luki I will let you know though go ahead Luke Luke, the, Luke wants to know what the different sized cat territories are. I mean, the cat territories really are determined by the food resource. Um, I couldn't give you a, a size right now. Uh, it could be anywhere from from probably 10 hectares to 50 hectares, really. It depends on the food resource. So leopards or lions that you find in, uh, in this area, the food resource is quite high. But the same, exactly the same species you find in the Kalahari, where the deserts spread the game out much further there's much less game available the territories are three times the size so it's all about prey it's all about food resource and um, that's probably why we see so many leopards in the area the, the preferred habitat here nice thick dense vegetation attracts lots of of daca there's lots of scrub hares franklins and then obviously multitudes of impala which have facilitated really really nice food for the animals it's kind of like moving into your local area and uh, a shopping center being designed to cater for the amount of people in and around. And I've noticed since I've grown up how many more shopping centers there are in the areas I grew up in. It's purely got to do with the demand for food. Take those shopping centers away and people will have to move somewhere else. Except the fact is that it used to be we used to grow our own food. But uh, urbanization has changed. So I think we're going to go see those lions. What do you think, ladies and gentlemen? Well, you don't really have a choice right now because I'm going there. So jump on board. It's getting nice and cool. The Avoca males hopefully will maybe give us a bit of a demonstration of how loud they can call. That would be nice. So Sens, you just let me know whenever you want to go into IR. Obviously, we can wait wait for um <clears throat> for an animal perhaps tell luke it will count to it will count to five lukey five four three two one go time here we go the optical illusion did you see how powerful my hand is i can turn over the screen i can i can make color disappear powerful my next magic trick is well I'm going to have to think about that. <laughs> no show. Come on. Come on, Luke. Want a show? Can't give them all away, no? Yeah, I forgot. I forgot. In my, in my other jacket. Forgot my cards in my other jacket. Maybe we'll find a scrub here and I'll 
pull it out of a hat or something. <laughs> I'm being silly now. All good. Nothing wrong with being silly from time to time. So Luke was saying if we see the lions, it'll be an absolute home run for a game drive. So yeah, we would have seen a really nice herd of elephant. Probably the best. I can't remember having a nice elephant sighting in my life, to be honest with you. So those of you who managed to watch that, or if you missed it, go back and watch. It was... Sure, I didn't know where to look. There was so much going on. So much going on. So yeah, so where we turned onto this road further back is is further south from that is where the baboons were shouting this morning and the leopard was down there and the tracks we followed of the leopard was through there so i don't think it's the same leopard definitely tundi from this morning but while we make our way into the lines and see exactly where about taylor is after her cheetah i'm listening to a fork-tailed drongo listen to this I don't know if you can see it, but straight through here, there's a forktail drongo. Not this tree, the little one behind her. That's a forktail drongo mimicking. Yeah, go in there. Maybe drop down just a little bit. Now, let me quickly put my spotlight there. Uh, I don't know where you are now. Yeah. Oh, there he is. You can see him just a little bit. Here we go. We're going to go into infrared. Luke, is that okay? That's okay. Here we go. So there's the forktail drongo that is now mimicking the pearl spotted owlet. It's just a bit difficult, as you can see, it's behind a branch. How incredible is that? And what I've noticed with them is that they do the... But they don't go... See? Shall I do the call properly and let's see if it copies me? <laughs> How cool is that? It's finishing off the call for me. It's just, just to the right. There it is. But for those of you that never believed that a fork-tailed drongo can mimic other birds, here we go, doing an absolutely sterling job this evening. And they mimic a number of different things. Choo, choo! Look this fly. There he is. Having an absolute time of his life. Or its life. I don't know if it's a girl or a boy. Okay, fork-tailed drongo, are you ready for another one? That is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Now remember we are in infrared of course, we switched over using a light that is, um, well, not going to bother the birds and normally at this time of the night we wouldn't be able to see them. How cool was that though? Did you enjoy that Ferg? Yeah. Something a little bit different. Wonderful. Right, well after all those fun and games, let's get down to business with the evokers. with the evoker males we can see two of them right now the third one is where we left them this morning but they're slowly moving back sort of northish towards where we are parked right now you can't see the other one right now but that's fine we'll focus on the one we can see he's hiding behind there somewhere there is another line there I do promise you and this is the time of day to come and spend time with lions because um, it's when they start getting up and moving. Listening, smelling, belly starts to growl, then hopefully they will start calling for us. Wouldn't that be something? That would be something to see on that. Uh... Yeah, so 
Maybe like what Taylor was doing with the Tronga, I can do a little bit of a of a raw off with the lions here. But that would be quite something to, to see lions roaring with that thermal camera, the fleur, to see the heat generated as they push that air out of their mouth. I would love to see that. Don't worry, these things will happen, folks. They will happen. Lots of ideas. I know Dr. Owen Davies has asked me a few questions he'd like us to check out. I'm going to add them to the list. Elephants, ears in their body, hornbills, um, I think was looked at last night, the, the cap of a guinea fowl, all these thermoregulatory things that we, that people postulate or ideas behind them. Good to see. Also nice to see how hot the, the, the paws of a lion is when they're lying down in the heat of the day, to see if they are indeed generating that enormous amounts of heat. Arizona lady, they are gorgeous. Now, can they sing? So that would have been cool if he just started roaring there, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would have been magic trick number two for the day. <laughs> oh, indeed. Luke said that at exactly the same time I did in my ear. Okay, well, you might see a light in a moment. There's another vehicle with the third male who's slowly walking in this direction so let me just move up so we can maybe see him obviously sorry Lukey I didn't quite hear you there Well, that's a really good idea. <clears throat> I mean, a good question. I mean, my opinion, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, hang on, what did he do there? He's doing a bit of a scent marking. There he's claiming this land. There's a, as I said, one of the other game viewers there looking at these lions as well. There's the yawn. That's going to mean he's going to stand up, is it? Going to stand up. So, Paula wants to know which cat has got the highest body temperature. Now, you know, I think the bigger the cat is, the higher its temperature can be, and the smaller the animal, the more fluctuation in the temperature there is. So I would suppose that a lion is probably the hottest, and then moving down to a domestic cat, but then I really don't know. <coughs> I really don't know. <coughs> these are things, you're going to have to do a lot of reading about these soon, because we, we launched the, the flare the other night, and I must say, I found myself wanting and a lot of a lot of thoughts that came forward. There's a whole spectrum of stuff I've never ever considered. Oh, he's found a very awkward place to walk through. <laughs> you don't look so tough anymore, do you, big guy? So now one of these lions this morning had a really weird growth off of his left testicle. And uh, one of the viewers, Niazi, was very, very kind to go back and spend a lot of time She's got a lot of time to, to look back at lion body parts. <laughs> Thank you for that. And took a screenshot of of um, the growth. And we don't know what it is. I have no idea what it is. But it almost looked like a, a third sort of smaller testicle or some form of growth inside. And he was the one who was walking quite gingerly. So maybe it is that one because he didn't look very comfortable walking through through the branches there and he also was the third one to move which means he's probably not the most comfortable of walkers at the moment and what that's from I have absolutely no idea I will reshare it again later and see if uh, there's anyone out there that knows exactly what's going on with that hmm Mika um, I wouldn't. I think I always get surprised by a lion's roar. I'm always so impressed by them. They never cease to amaze me how loud how loud they can be. But surprised, you know. I think I just enjoy them so much that when you hear them, your body actually shivers with with what happened. So not surprised in general, but just there's absolute awe in them because it's it's body shaking, bone chilling, bone chilling stuff as you can hear. 
little spots to Howland in the background. I'm going to see if I can find that picture that I was sent and maybe show you all. Okay. Well, there was a picture earlier. Okay, I have found it. Will you be able to see it, Sens? If I put this on the dashboard here. Not the best light. Let me just give that a wipe. It's very difficult with the light, though. But there is the, the back of him, obviously, the tail. I don't think we need too much identification, but what is that up there? Here is his two genitalia, and there is the penis sheath over there. And then there's something there that matched the color of his fur. It almost looked like a growth from inside. There was nothing on the other side. I saw that clearly with my binoculars. So if any of you out there know what this is, please let us know. Um, I have no idea. I can't say I've spent too much time looking at the private parts of the lion, but I've never seen that before in my many observations of them. Okay. Is that one moving? No. They're still quite stationary. They are listening to the night choruses and no doubt will be listening far off for any challenges that might be placed out in the distance. Not a bad look. Look at those beautiful, beautiful eyes. Sorry about the stick. I did reposition so as to get the other two males walking, which is what you as a guide try and do for your guests, is to position a vehicle in such a nice way that you don't obstruct the animal, but you park in a way that the, the lion walks past you or the leopard, so you can get some great shots. And obviously, as we did that, he decided to gingerly take a nap once again because he hasn't slept enough today the third lion that joined them he hasn't slept enough but I'm feeling that they might call aren't you Sens? Mm. it's nearly nearly full moon sure Chris I I have no idea I've never thought about cancer and lions um, you know these are these are things that you know, animal pathology and animal diseases is something I definitely need to put a, more, a bit more focus on. Anyone out there know about lion cancer? I've heard of feline AIDS, but I've never heard of lion cancer. Um, how many, maybe I should ask him, how many cigarettes have you smoked today, sir? Um, he doesn't understand. No, he's not going to tell me. And even if he did understand, I don't think I would understand. You just see him sitting there with his giant paw with the cigarette in it. I don't know. Okay, well, we're going to stay here with these guys, and hopefully they're going to call. Well, while we wait, let's go see what night critters Taylor's managed to scrounge out of the darkness. No, but funny that you mention that, Steve. We're going to be driving down this long, dusty road now. Because remember, a little while ago, I was telling you, every time I came onto this fire break for a bushwalk, we would see fresh evidence of porcupine, lots of genet, civet, and then aardvark as well. So I think it's about time that I come and did this route, and we just happen to be in the area. So we're going to drive along it and see if we can't catch one of the many nocturnal critters that frequent this area. And there's something on the road. <laughs> Out, a night jar. There is a fire, or well, maybe not even a fiery night. Neck night jar could be a different night jar. We'll see if we can have a look. It is. Does look like it's hawking insects at the moment. Just scan off here until we get a bit closer. Also, a good area for bush babies. You see it just there. Oh. Sorry, there's a serious noise now coming from the vehicle. I mean, that is a night jar of sorts. I don't know which one it is. It's very difficult to tell, especially when it is dark like this in the infrared, obviously when you lose the color. Is that supposed to be making that noise? Can you hear that, Ferg? 
Sorry, we're just trying to sort things out. Sorry, everybody, we're just having some technical difficulties on some light. Okay. Well, we're just going to try and sort out which other fan has decided to pop on. Oh, there we go. But nice to see one of the nocturnal creatures, and hopefully it's not the last. Thanks, Taylor. Not much has changed. You haven't missed any calling. They are definitely getting ready, though, to get up. And they might call before they get up, or they might not. Um, if they're hungry enough, they might just get up and go start hunting. But if they sated enough, they might decide to shout themselves to the wilderness. Who knows? Bearing in mind this is 100% live, and these are 100% wild lions. They do not receive Twitter or any emails, so we can't pre-plan anything that might happen. And on that note, anything could happen. Kristen, that's a good question. I mean, it, it initially when, when lions want to sort of establish their territory, they will be quite vocal. But um, once the territory is established, the need to be vocal is, is actually increased because they want to avoid others moving into that area. And the, the point of being vocal is to demarcate an area and to say this is occupied, don't come here. Um, and it works a lot of the time unless the ones who hear it are willing to challenge. So we haven't, we, we haven't heard them too much of late. They were called this morning. I didn't hear it in the distance, but you know, they seem to be claiming this area. They've definitely sent marked there. Um, I didn't follow them too much this morning. We had tracks for a little bit and then they were found quite quickly, which is always quite nice. It's, it takes a lot of time sometimes to find male lions because, oh, there we go. That's a nice yawn. Beautiful set of teeth. Why, thank you, sir, he says. Beautiful. Um, male lions sometimes move in and out and they can cover a, a huge distance. I mean, our, our property, Juma, is a very small blip in their movement spectrum, and I have no doubt, unless they kill something. Oh, there we go. There's too much. He's going to get up now. Um, unless they kill something, they will be gone by the morning. I'm almost certain of it, because they just walk straight through to the other side, and they'll go all the way through to Bifosuk again, and up to Manuleti, and as they move, they patrol, and they send mark, and they re-establish, and they call, and just announcing their presence so and if they stop doing that then that area becomes available and you might get unknowingly unaware males moving in so the calling is a very obvious sign of immediate occupation and also when two of them or three of them call it can be a little bit daunting to one or two that might be nearby and be like um, I might not go and have a go at those guys there three of them This is a very hard life being a lion, folks. Very hard life. Oh, Seb says he got up on the right there. Michelle, it is always amazing seeing these guys. You're right. Now, they are related, we think, or we assume. They are brothers, or from the same litter anyway, if not the same parent, the same sort of brood time. So what you're very likely to see is this guy's going to walk up to the other guy, give him a bit of a rub on the head, and be like, come on, let's go, let's go, brother in arms, there we go. And he's going to get up, <clears throat> and they're going to come and they're going to walk right past our car. See, that one on the left is the one, <clears throat> possibly with the growth. I'm going to keep quiet for a little bit. You can probably see the back of my head. I'm not going to turn, Senzo. Big male lions walking past me right now. You guys are enormous. Enormous. Did you see? Oh, did you see that look he gave you, Sens? I tell you, folks, you can do it a hundred times and it never gets old, eh? He's busy scent marking again. Never gets old. A lion walking past you like that is unbelievable to behold. 
when you said you get surprised when they when they roar at you. When they roar at you, you get surprised. When they look at me like that, my heart stops. Okay, well, we're going to reposition, and in the meantime, let's go over to Taylor while we catch our breath. We haven't found anything yet. Our hope in finding an aardvark on that uh, fire break was not, was not successful. Oh, well, at least we tried. Uh, now... Now I'm not even on the right road to find that bush baby that's living in the, one of the dead trees. I've taken the wrong road. I thought I was on Weaver's Nest for a second, but I realized that I'm actually on Shibamu. What did I just see? Ah, oh. no, it is a, um, a daker, but very, very far away. I just saw its eyes in the distance in the grass hiding about. Ooh, we're the chameleons. Man, it's a nice night to see a chameleon. I mean, I'm all wrapped up again. But it, uh, we still have a chance of seeing him. We've just got to look hard. I'm glad you all enjoyed the cheetah, and I'm so glad that the cheetah came back. So fingers crossed that they'll be there on the sunrise safari. That would be ideal. And we know that they're getting hungrier and hungrier, so our chances are even better to potentially see them chasing something down. So I know exactly where I'll be headed first thing in the morning. I'm going to race into that area and, uh, and try and find them again. But... They seem to get a head start on us though, so maybe, maybe I shouldn't head to their last position. Maybe I should try and think a bit like a cheetah and head to some of those open areas. I'm so sorry. The insects keep getting me. I want to show you. Look, I was, I murdered one already. If you look here, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, I'll put a little bit of light on that, that smudge. That there was a midge. I killed it. I took it out of my eye and then I squashed it. That is the end of it. That's what happens when you fly into my eye and I get you. Normally they break up into bits and pieces like that into your eye, which is not very nice. And, uh, yeah, it can make you sort of very itchy. And it tends to irritate my eyes. I'm pretty sure it would irritate anybody's eyes. And there's lots of them about all of a sudden. It's just, just all of a sudden. The last few nights have been so good. There haven't been any insects whatsoever, but it must have been a little, a little burst. And I can see them all flying around, so I'm going to be driving around like this with my... Hopefully my eyelashes will do the trick and uh, keep all the bugs out. But let's go and see if the Wally well, Vokers are going to give Steve another walk by. Well, Taylor, <clears throat> I think I need to buy you a pair of my safety glasses for those bugs. They're very cheap, 20 Rand. What's that? It's very cheap. I don't know how to convert that into dollars. It's very cheap. 20 rand. <laughs> 50p, 50 cents. Somewhere around there. So the two males have crossed the road. The third one has not joined. Now looking directly towards camp. Directly towards our home. Zach, that is the story on everyone's lips, is that they are moving into an area that was previously occupied by the Birmingham boys, who have now moved south because a vacancy has opened up there, some better real estate, so to speak, and now they have moved in from the north. Whether they're going to stay, whether they're going to keep moving, whether they're going to stay further north than where they are, is hard to say. It's definitely something that we're watching very closely purely because it, uh, it has the potential to cause harm to the prides that we have, the existing prides and their cubs. So it is a soap opera, opera unfolding in front of us. These new big males have come through and uh, it will be very interesting what is going to happen. What will happen indeed? Copied orbs, I'll be leaving shortly. Okay, so as this one goes off, the third one has not yet joined. This is the one I thought that had the growth. Maybe we'll get a, an infrared look at it. 
But what an afternoon we have had, ladies and gentlemen. James Hendry is back there. It is. The growth is on the left. James Hendry is back. The evoker males are back. We had awesome elephants and cheetah sightings. What a week it has started out to be compared to last week. It is going to be a blinder of a week here. It's been awesome that you've joined us. Thank you for the questions and the comments and the feedback and for always being there. Here comes the last one. Thanks very much. And from all of us here at Safari Live, we will be seeing you again tomorrow morning. Tune in bright and early. I'll be on a bushwalk with the medicinals. And we'll see you then. Have a beautiful night.